Welcome everyone to the Open Space Board of Trustees meeting of the City of Boulder for June 9th, 2021. Um, as is our custom, we start the meeting with a roll call. Do we have Karen Holwick? Here. Do we have Dave Kuntz? Here. Do we have Caroline Miller? Present. And do we have Michelle Estrella? Here. Wonderful. We have the full board. Um, that's fantastic. I'm going to hand it over straight to Allison, who is going to start off with an overview of the meeting rules. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for joining us this evening in order to strike a balance between transparent engagement and online security. The following rules will be applied to tonight's meeting. This meeting has been called to conduct the business of the city of Boulder. Activities that disrupt, delay, or interfere with the meeting are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions may be limited. No person shall speak except when recognized by the person presiding, and no person shall speak for longer than the time allotted. Each person shall register to speak at the meeting using that person's real name, so we need a first and last name before we'll ask you to unmute yourself tonight. So if you've joined, I see an iPad uh, 3.0 or something has joined this evening, we would ask that you rename yourself before you uh, would be able to unmute. If you uh, don't want, if you can't un rename yourself, you can message me in the chat and I will un rename you. No video will be permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers and presenters. All others will participate by voice only. The person presiding at the meeting shall enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates any rule. The chat function is enabled to host to me only, and that is for Zoom or technical related questions, not content, not meeting content. If an attendee attempts to use chat for any other reason than seeking assistance from the host, the city reserves the right to disable that individual's access to the chat. And only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screen during this meeting. And in, we'll get to some uh, public comment and public hearing opportunities later. In order to raise your hand, if you wish to speak during that time, you can click on the participants icon, most likely at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And then when that opens up, you'll see these three little dots on the right hand bottom of that box, participants box, and then you'll have your raise hand feature. Some um, shortcuts for that on a PCR Alt-Y or on a Mac are Option-Y. And if you're joining us by phone tonight, you can press star nine later on to raise your hand. And that's it. Thank you very much, Allison. Appreciate you setting us up that way. Um, before we go to discuss the minutes, um, I would like to uh, give, give it over to Michelle Estrella for a moment um, for some brief moments of praise and positivity about our department. Yes, thank you so much, Hal. Um, last month at our meeting, we had a chance to hear from, um, from Mark Davison about um, how uh, our rangers are such heroes and, and with the example of um, them being on site um, at King, the King Supers uh, tragedy. And um, I had a personal experience with the Ranger also in the context of not actually physically being on open space that I wanted to relay happened to me last Thursday. Um, and they, uh, his name was uh, Brian Litwin. I was leaving Belmont Bike Park. And um, after my kids did a bike camp, somebody had crashed into my bike rack it looked okay, but once I got onto Foothill, Foothills Parkway, um, it was not okay, and the rack and the bikes um, came off. And um, and um, Brian helped me get at least protect me from traffic, and um, the kids stayed safe inside the, the vehicle and helped me unload the vehicles and tell the vehicle until um, City of Boulder police could arrive and get me off to uh, safely off of Foothills Parkway. And I just, it's just a wonderful example of how um, our Rangers are superheroes to our community. And I, I really wanted to make sure that um, our department gets positive feedback. You know, these are really hard jobs that they have to do. And I was just amazed with the kindness and the competence of, of um, 
this this particular ranger, but that that's really true of everyone I've encountered so far. So thank you so much for the time. Thanks, Michelle and Burton. Thank you for being here with us. Um, certainly, your team uh, being out there each and every day is of great benefit in so many ways. Thank you both, Michelle and Hal, for those comments. It just yeah, as Brian would say, it's just Brian being Brian, but. Um, he will really appreciate the recognition. So I'll make sure he hears that. Great. Thank you so much. Um, with that, we will uh, launch into tonight's business at hand by starting to review the minutes of our prior meeting, May 12th, 2021. And uh, as is our format, we usually begin on page one. And does anyone have any issues with page one of the minutes of the prior meeting? Um, I have a couple little tiny edits that I've sent to Leah. I don't know whether we need to belabor them. Are they strictly typographical? If they're content related, we should discuss them. Uh, one is to delete an extra two and what TO, and one is to add State Park after El Dorado. Great. I don't think anyone will have any trouble with that. That's great. How about on the second page? In the list of things we discussed about OSO, um, I, I mentioned the fencing and signage at the boundaries of OSMP and OSO properties. Uh, can you can you point to wh which uh, where exactly you are? Uh, the the paragraph under the non bolded paragraph under agenda item four. Okay. Where it lists clarifying questions about the OSO lands. I do have recollection with that. Anybody opposed to adding that? Then uh, if, we, if we can add that, that's wonderful. Thank you. Anything else on page two? Okay, hearing nothing, for, Dave. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted and didn't, wasn't fast enough. <laughs> um, under uh, agenda item six, where it says that I moved the, the board the tables for final consideration. I think it's worth putting a sentence in there that the board discussed the draft uh, so that there's some context for the motion. And so I would um, just suggest that language to the effect that uh, the boards uh, discuss the content of the draft and decided that uh, it needed further time to uh, consider uh, the recommendations or something like that. How about, um, Leah, is it possible in an unbolded uh, sentence above Dave Kuntz's move to say the board discussed the uh, draft proposal resolution um, and then we'll, we'll go to Dave moved and then we discussed the committee. That is the order of operations as I recall it. That'd be That's great. Good. Thank you so much. Um, on page three. I, I'd like to suggest immediately under the one that we were just talking about okay. to do the same thing right before the bolded part about Dave Kuntz move the Open Space Board of Trustees make the following statement to just add not bolded a statement that said the board discussed the letter to the Colorado Wildlife Commission. Great. Sounds good to me. And on page three. That was largely verbatim. And then we have attribution and the meeting adjourned at 11 p.m. Okay, um, seeing no other changes, 
um, I will seek a motion to approve the minutes of the board meeting of May 12th, 2021. Karen Hallwig, I see you moving. Do we have a second? I, I move that we approve the minutes as amended. At, approved as amended. Second. And Michelle, your second? So we'll call the roll. Um, well, I guess, Karen, you clearly approved. Dave? Uh, yes. Okay, Caroline Miller? Yes. Uh, and Michelle, you do as well. I also approve, so that's unanimous business. Thank you so much. So with that, um, Dan, I will hand it, uh, well, actually, I, I believe actually we, we go to public comment next. And the public comment that we are going to take um, right now uh, is for matters that are uh, those which are not starred on our agenda, meaning they have a specific opportunity for pu uh, public comment on each of those topics, a uh, uh, public hearing, in fact. So if anyone from the public would like to make generalized comments about the department or the meeting, this would be an excellent time for you to raise your hand uh, here in Zoom and we will have two minutes um, per person to make generalized public comment. Okay, we have four people signed up in advance and we'll start with Jean Ashenbrenner first. And Jean, um, when you unmute yourself, please state your first and last name and then I'll start the timer. So you can um, unmute yourself now. I'm Jean Ashenbrenner, and I sent the board a note about parking overnight at Joda Ranch. And I wanted to say, first of all, thank you very much. I got responses from a couple people, and I have a better understanding that the staff is limited in what they can do. But I wanted to, to but their hearts are into, okay, we got to deal with this, but we've also got other places we have to deal with. But I kind of wanted just to make a statement in front of the board. Um, I see a couple major problems. One, that there's no toilet. And second, these vans that are parked there are taking up limited parking space. So actually one time I went and there wasn't any more normal parking. So I had to park in the horse parking. Um, one night I actually went out and checked like at midnight and there were vans parked there. So I called the non-emergency police line and ended up talking to somebody who said he was gonna go out and chase them away. The next morning I went and the vans were still there, but I think they were in a different position than they'd been before. Meaning I suspect he did go out and talk to them and maybe they went away and then just came back. So I see it as the underlying problem, likely being the social media. And I had kind of an idea that if we could nip it in the bud there, like if we had an open space mountain park volunteer who was really good at apps or some high school student um, who was interested in that, if they could go in and monitor some of these apps where people share suggestions of places to go, maybe then they could enter in response to that sharing that it's not legal to park there and it's going to be enforced and people should avoid parking there. And maybe that would discourage people from going there. And last, I just want to thank you guys all for being the board and putting the time in. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. I, I wanted to just ask a clarifying question. Dan, is there or is not there not signage at that location about camping? Yeah, when we received uh, Jean's comment, one of the first things we did is we went out there to check the signage situation. And we realized that it could be enhanced and actually and developed and actually installed signage shortly thereafter. So I, th I think it would. I think it's pretty clear now. Thank you so much. Great. I really appreciate that kind of responsiveness. Dan, can you tell us um, what the policy is about parking at uh, trailheads? Yeah. Uh, no parking after eleven. Eleven, or before what? I, I believe it's five. Uh, you can park from five to eleven. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, is P I don't see Peter Mayer on. He was next signed up on the 
Eventbrite list from the web, but I don't see that name. So let's move on to Ken Vitel. Let me find you. Okay, you should be able to unmute yourself, Ken. Great. Thank you, Allison. Just wanted to make sure you can hear me. Thank you. Hello, good evening. This is Ken Vitel with the proposed Metal Arc open space at CU South. First, thank you board members for your service to date in wisely managing, protecting, and creating new open spaces. Over the last two years, I have gotten to know the wisdom and the actions and the request of the Open Space Board and have been very impressed with your dedication to protection of open spaces and uh, looking out for the interests of the Boulder community along with recreational opportunities. Over these two years, I'm very grateful that you have asked Boulder City Council for detailed environmental impact studies of proposed development at CU South and specifically on the impact to the endangered species at the South Boulder Creek State Natural Area, which is some of the most important wet wetlands habitat in all of Colorado. I'm here tonight uh, to speak on the uh, draft resolution uh, from the city of Boulder um, with regards to flood mitigation and annexation. Uh, the merits of the Metal Arc open space are full protection of the Boulder, South Boulder Creek State Natural Area and 500 year flood protection versus the current proposed 100 year. I humbly request that the board decline the uh, city's request to dispose of land in the state natural area um, as full environmental impact studies have not been conducted. I appreciate the board's dedication to open space and again, I thank you for your service. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate it. Okay. I also don't see Karen Gubelman. She also had signed up earlier online. I don't see her name in this meeting yet. And do we have any hands up from anybody else uh, who was not previously registered? Nope. Okay. Um, we, oh, we have one now. <laughs> And, and Hal, if we could just remind folks about the public hearing opportunities. Thank you. Certainly, we, we will remind folks we have, uh, there's actually four segments for public comment tonight. This first one is meant for comments on anything other than the three official public hearings we're holding on the agenda. Those relate to the capital improvement budget, the conveyance of a non-exclusive easement um, for a fish passage project, and then, of course, uh, the South Boulder Creek flood mitigation project. So if you have comments uh, on things other than those three items, you're welcome to make those comments now. OK, so Lynn Siegel, you uh, can unmute yourself and please um, state your first and last name. Yeah, I thought that since that last guy spoke to see you south, that she's not. it's hard to find your agenda on the website. It's you know, it doesn't say agenda anywhere. It says look for the meeting. Um, anyway, um, first of all, <coughs> and everything relates to CU South. Everything I say at any meeting about anything to do with Boulder relates to CU. I don't see, you can't extricate them. <laughs> That's the problem. But Lynn, Lynn I, I, we can let you speak for the remaining time on CU South, but you, you're going to give up time yeah, during that no, event, no, okay? I'm, no, I'm going to speak in general, and it is indirectly CU South because everything is about CU. Um, but my point is we need to balance jobs housing, and there, there needs to be a better integration between Open Space Board of Trustees, RAB, um, Planning Board, and Housing Advisory Board, because those are all boards of huge import to the, the stewardship and the use of 
um, of open space, Boulder's open space. And of course, population is the single biggest fac factor that, um, that has an environmental degradation on, on our open spaces. And maintaining a constant, you know, some kind of check on population is the best and the most direct and the most demand related um, preservation of open space. So I suggest you really get on to that because you're going to be chasing your tail if you're trying to make up for the destruction that happens after jobs housing is out of control, which it already is. And after there's all this development that's going on in Boulder that, that is just unsustainable and just draws more and more tourism to the area, which is not functioning economically to sustain the open space. There needs to be cost benefit analysis and there needs to be jobs housing balance, a balance made. Thank you very much, Lynn, we appreciate it. Um, any hands raised in the interim period? I'm seeing none. Nope, not for the general public comment. Okay, thank you so much, Allison. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Dan. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing about the department's capital improvement program. Yeah, so we're a little more than halfway through uh, our touch bases with you on various portions of our budget. And tonight we are seeking a recommendation on the CIP. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren Kilcoyne and Sam McQueen. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Lauren Kilcoyne, Central Services Manager, and I'm here with Samantha McQueen, our new Business Services Manager for our 2022 CIP recommendation. Um, and Sam, if you're able to cast. Perfect, thank you. And next slide. So this is our um, 10 month or so uh, budget agenda for the year. And we are on the third and final touch for the CIP. Since we saw you last, uh, back on May 12th, we have submitted our recommended CIP to the planning department. So around this time each year, a bunch of things start happening concurrently. We're working with you all at the board. Um, we're working with planning staff and we incorporate their feedback before we go to planning board. And then we're also working with the executive budget team made up of the city manager, the CFO and a number of department directors. So um, here we are tonight for your recommendation on the CIP. And then when we come back next month, July and August, we'll be focused on the operating budget. Next slide. So we're gonna keep things very brief tonight. Y'all have a stacked agenda and we had a, a lot of agreement in the May meeting, which is wonderful. I will give a very quick budget process update and then hand it off to Sam for the follow-up from May. Any clarifying questions before public comment and recommendation? Next slide. So I have two uh, budget process update slides. The first relates to the CIP and we did just have the adjustment to base, the first adjustment to base on the 2021 current year budget approved by council. And this includes 2020 capital carryover to 2021. So any appropriated dollars from previous years that were not spent are carried forward into 2021 and added with our current year approved budget to ensure that project managers and staff have what they need to execute on multi-year projects. When we come back next month, we'll be bringing a fund financial and there's a line item in that that shows our adjustment to base total. That is a large number, it's around $13 million. And so in the April written information, we tried to provide a lot more um, clarity around what makes that up. So we know we have the 5.3 million in revenues collected last year to pay for the current year purchase of Long's Gardens the conservation easement at Long's Gardens. We also have the balance of the acquisition CIP, which we save over multiple years to support high priority investments. That's about 3.5 million. Um, and then we have a couple dozen projects that are multi-year projects that we uh, save over several years to, to complete construction. So that has all been approved by council. It's been posted to the budget and staff are well on their way to accomplishing the 2021 work plan. And on the 2022 CIP that we're discussing tonight, we did actually present to the city's peer review team earlier this week on Monday. 
that is made up of planning staff and project managers and business services managers from other departments who are looking at our 2022 CIP for alignment with the city manager's recommended budget, for consistency with expectations across the city. And we received wonderful feedback on the approach, in particular, the connection to the master plan, the connection between the master plan and the budget, um, with some requests to, to share our work planning system with other departments. And we had very minor feedback, um, nothing that, Im that impacts the CIP that's presented in this packet. And kudos to Sam a couple months in um, on the job going out and presenting to peer review team. Next slide. And then on the operating side, which is, it's not the focus of tonight, but we will be getting to that very quickly in July, just a couple of updates. So we continue to work with the finance department to revise the budget guidelines. That is made up of all of the dollars that we pay to other city departments, whether that's computer replacement fund or fleet, fleet maintenance and replacement, cost allocation, those types of things. Um, as we're getting more information in around current year revenue projections, as we're hearing more from other departments about what their 2022 budget request will be, we're working through that to make sure that when we come in July, we have a really solid fund financial for you. On the personnel expenditure side, we just completed the second of four personnel models for the year, and that is our largest department expenditure between standard, seasonal, and temporary staff. So it is our goal, which I, I wrote in the packet this month, to restore our operating budget, um, fully restore any COVID-19 reductions that we made. So that includes, uh, we had about 321,000 in vacancy holds on standard positions and you know we're coming off of furloughs and hiring freeze and everything related to COVID. So it is a goal in the 2022 budget that we'll talk about more next month to uh, fully restore our operating budget. And then our sort of biggest presentation outside of the board for the year is to the executive budget team on June 23rd. That includes both CIP and operating. Um, and we will have, we submitted about four budget requests that we'll talk with you about, uh, we'll talk with you next month about um, and we anticipate that that's very aligned with, with what our new city manager is looking for in our EBT presentation. So with that, I will hand it off to Sam for the rest of the presentation. Thanks. Um, I'll discuss budget updates since our May business meeting. We received updated 2022 to 26 revenue projections for the open space fund from central finance since our last presentation. In green, the department is now expecting $29.8 million in sales and use tax revenue in 2022, which represents a $4 million increase from initial projections. Revenues can be used for CIP projects, operating budget, and reserves in future years. Over a six-year planning horizon, the projections provide for an additional $22 million in sales and use tax revenues over initial projections for the Open Space Fund. OSMP will continue with plans to fund the CIP at $5.4 million in 2022, as presented at the May business meeting. It represents a $904,000 increase from 2021 and still needs staff capacity to implement projects next year. We have a goal to restore COVID-19 reductions in the operating budget over a six-year period with the additional revenue. That translates to 321,000 in personnel budget and 980,000 in non-personnel budget per year for a total impact of 7.8 million over six years. We also anticipate increasing CIP funding from 2023 to 27 above 2022 levels. And the department is already in the work planning process to program CIP funds in those years. At the May business meeting, we heard overall support for 2022 CIP projects and the approach from the OSBT. The department will continue to make connections between the budget and master plan and will accelerate tier one strategies. As mentioned earlier, OSMP will also restore COVID-19 reductions to the extent possible, as well as program funds from the 15% sales tax increment. We haven't proposed changes to the project list since it was presented to OSBT in May. Of the $5.4 million CIP presented this evening, the motion accounts for 428,000 funded by the lottery fund and the remaining 4.9 million funded by the open space fund. So that concludes our presentation. Um, does the OSBT have any clarifying questions regarding the department's recommended 2022 CIP? Caroline. 
sorry, I kind of see us and I got confused. Um, thank you so much for your uh, presentation, Sam. I appreciate that. And um, congrats to you guys um, that your example is being requested at other departments. I'm sure that's really wonderful to hear. Um, what I have to um, ask and bring up, I think there's two things. Um, and in our packet, I know that we're gonna be discussing retreat stuff coming up anyways. So this is more for the retreat, but I feel um, when we're doing the budget that um, when we are being presented with it, we're at a point where if there was something that the board wanted to see differently, it feels like it would be um, almost a, a negative counterbalance to, to say something because of how much work is done prior to that. So um, again, this is, is something that'll come back around in the board retreat. Um, but I don't know if there is maybe a touching point between the very end and at the middle that perhaps we could do. Uh, did you just unmute yourself, Lauren? Yeah, and, and I didn't want to cut you off at all. I want to make sure I heard your full thought. Yeah, no, go ahead. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think retreat is a great opportunity. When we did retreat last fall, we, we spent a lot of time on um, you know, here's our proposal on how to connect budget and master plan, and here's our proposal on next steps and asset management, those types of things. I think that would be a great opportunity to talk about priority setting for the next year. Uh, the prairie dog work was a good example of that, right, where we were having those conversations in, with enough time to then in the next budget cycle incorporate it. Um, so, so I think that's fair, and I think retreat is appropriate. Um, you know, that said, if there, if there is a point, you know, in April and May where, where things, things don't look like, like you think they should, um, we're, we're always happy to hear that, that feedback. Um, and, and hopefully in May, I, I think what we heard is that we're on the right track, but maybe as we look at 23 to 27, um, there's opportunities to, to make sure that we're continuing to take feedback in that, that space. And, and obviously we're coming off a very wacky year and you guys, yeah. have, you know, <laughs> such a good job with like what you were handed. Um, but but my, um, my questions would be related, unless they have been updated, our CIP guiding principles are um, what are listed are from 2016. So I don't know if in the last five years they've been updated, but related to those, um, there are seven guiding principles and number four and number seven, um, it might be that they are being done, um, but for um, example, seven is um, capital programming should maximize efficiency of investments demonstrated by measurable cost benefit analysis and coordination of projects across departments and within funds. And I think that um, finding maybe a better way in that retreat to figure out how to communicate things um, with the cost benefit analysis, um, because what I see in the packet um, is great and good, but I, I don't know that it actually really gives us that for the CIP, like the way that it maybe does with the operating budget. Um, so just kind of pointing that out for us, like moving forward. Um, and again, it, you know, it, it was a long year with COVID and, and I um, think that you guys really did a wonderful job, but, you know, just moving forward. Oh, and number four was um, just to provide enough capacity and flexibility in our long-term planning to be able to respond to emerging unanticipated needs. So maybe, um, like creating a, a section where we talk about, you know, things like fire, flood, COVID, um, and, you know, and, and how moving forward, we, we take care of that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and, and what Caroline's referring to, I, be, I believe those are out of the citywide budget book, right? The, city, yeah. the guiding principles for the whole city. And yeah, point well taken. So we don't, we didn't write those, but certainly are part of them as, as part of the city. Um, we had taken a step to then make those more specific to the department, um, our budget guiding principles for the department. And in previous years, I would be talking about those as part of these presentations. When we, um, when we made the master plan, we got those sort of operationalized into the financial sustainability section of the master plan, and we had guiding principles in the master plan. Um, and so we, we have talked about things in, in the master plan language and not necessarily tied that back to those citywide defini definitions. So we can, that is, that's, a, that's an adjustment we can make moving forward. And, um, and that would be the expectation before these go to council in the fall is, is as finance and planning is presenting this to council. Um, that's the language that they'll use for that presentation. Yeah, and, and truthfully, um, number four and number seven probably wouldn't have even jumped out at me without 
COVID. Um, so it's it's more um, like in retrospective, you know, if, if these kind of events start happening more frequently. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and we use, I think it's FS2, the budget for future uncertainty is meant to capture that, like making sure we're building resilient budgets, fire and flood, and, and COVID was not anticipated at the time. <laughs> That is the intent of that strategy, and we can we can talk about that in that language a little bit better. Awesome, thank you, Ryan. Dave, thanks, Al. Uh, Lauren, I have a a suggestion or a request. Uh, I think it would be very helpful if in the CIP you could uh, in the in the uh, column that says Associated Department Assessment or Plan. Um, reference the uh, CIP items that are connected to the $40 million trail maintenance backlog. And the reason for that is I think uh, that uh, assertion uh, prior to and as part of the 2019 election uh, certainly caught the community's attention. And I think that we should, as you know, we progress through the years, make sure the community understands the relationship between some of these projects and and that uh, taking care of or funding that backlog. I think that would be very helpful, both uh, for the community as well as for the department. And also, um, you know, I think it's it sets the stage for a better understanding of kind of what's happening out there in the system. So I'm not sure you know exactly which projects uh, you know in the current CIP you know are considered to be part of uh, that effort but I think it's worth you know staff can note whatever they are um, I think that would be very helpful so, thanks. Sure, yeah that's a easy adjustment I think I did that for the facilities assessment and the packet and not the not the trails assessment so easy enough adjustment to make yeah Great. Mark, Lauren and Dave, I'll just point out that the vast majority of our efforts on trail maintenance is through our operating budget um, and, and less so out of the uh, CIP, which I think a number of our ongoing projects in which you think of OSMP, um, what comes to your mind is, is primarily funded out of our operating. So perhaps even in the memo, we could clarify and bring out that point in regards to trail maintenance as an example of uh, how operating funds the majority of that work. I think that'd be Sorry. real helpful, thanks. Karen. Um, I, I like the ideas that have been suggested so far. And I just wanna add that in terms of that uh, right-hand column, um, it, I guess in, in either instead or in addition to using the department lingo and the staff's lingo, it would be helpful to have a more public facing language um, so that the public understands where this money is going. And I wanna uh, recognize Brian Anaker's uh, public statement about the science that's going on on open space lands. And I think we need to, as we said in our last retreat, we need to continually do that kind of thing so that the public understands what the department is doing. And, and I think the kinds of things that have been suggested this evening under the CIP would further help us do that um, so that the public understands where this huge increase in capital maintenance funding for, this, uh, for 2022 is going and what they should be expecting to see happening. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, that was Brian does great work on that funded research program. That was great to see. And and point taken on. We 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 do like to sing our praises and can always do that more. <laughs> um, I'm gonna put my own up, hand up quickly. I have a couple questions just on the open space fund quickly, Lauren. Um, sure. If I'm reading it right, um, the department has approval for a total of 33 million in general obligation scope. 10 million of which is outstanding. So there's 23 approved that remains outstanding. And um, I have to imagine interest rates have fallen quite a bit since 2014. Do you know uh, uh, perchance what we're paying on general obligation commitments right now? 
Um, your, your outline is correct. There's 23 million in, in bonding capacity that we've not yet utilized. We're, we're currently repaying principal and interest on the 2014 bond. And then BUMPA is a separate funding mechanism. We have two active BUMPA notes. We don't have active plans right now to bond. Um, we generally, about six months before we would undertake that process, we would start working with finance and with the city's attorneys for a bond rating and start looking at interest rates and negotiating. We are not in active conversations with them at this point for, for a potential bond issue. So when it says the department has been approved, it's uh, any issuance would still have to work through all the normal methodologies here through OSBT to city council, et cetera. Yes, yeah, they, um, that, that language of the vote, the voters gave approval for up to 33 million in future bonding capacity. So it was to say with the previous sales tax extension that we have approval to do that. Um, and then each individual bond issue would still go through the, the normal city process. Great. And then it also said that this is the first year there's been no general fund allocation to the department. Um, if you, in your experience and time with us, uh, were to throw a percentage on the average general fund allocation as a percentage of budget in prior years, what would that be? Oh, uh, you'd be between a million and a million and a half in an annual transfer, plus they've previously paid for positions. So may maybe you're at 1.7 million a year out of our total budget when I got here used to be 33 to 35 million a year before the point one, we lost that point one one increment in 2019, the 0.33 went to 0.22. So the base is different now, but it was under 2 million out of 35, I would say. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. Sure. Does anybody else have a new question or is I guess seeing no more clarifying questions, um, you know, uh, we, we are here with a recommendation for approval. Um, I do want to open up for any discussion people would like to have uh, prior to um, thinking about a recommendation. I th we probably should go to see if there's anybody to speak at public hearing and then we can oh, go to the okay, yep. discussions. Great. Allison, let's, um, let's open up the public hearing briefly. Okay, so I don't see any hands raised yet, but we'll give them, we'll give everyone a minute. And again, you can raise your hand by clicking on the participants icon. And then when that box opens, the three little dots at the bottom right hand corner. Yeah, I'm not seeing any. Oh, we have one hand. Okay, let's see. Lynn Siegel, you can unmute yourself and you'll get two minutes once you state your first and last name. Um, Lynn Siegel. Um, once again, um, the, um, I guess I would like to hear more about what the specific capital improvements are that we're working on now. And, and, and I think it's great news that the public should know the scope of the capital improvements and the scope of the general maintenance that we spend, because the more they're informed, it's kind of like getting people out in open space to get them to appreciate it so that they'll support it. It's kind of like the same thing. Once they understand really what it costs. And you know, I my neighbor, Alan Delamere is always coming down and saying, you know, we need better maintenance. And we, you know, then we have these issues of flooding and fires. And, and then there's trouble when, you know, we don't have as much money as we would like to be having. Um, when, when some of the bigger picture items haven't really been, the open space has it, Board of Trustees hasn't taken a stand on them. Like I think OSBT, well, they did in a way take a stand on 311 Mapleton but it wasn't really a strong stand that that was not a place to put seniors in the line of fire. And um, then these things have repercussions later on, I'm sure with the capital improvements budget, as well as the standard maintenance budget. Um, and those things need to be made, it, it, those connections need to be made to the public. 
so that they understand that um, the type of growth that they're putting, uh, you know, on the margins of the open space are significant um, and have repercussions later on with large money projects. Thanks. Thank you very much, Lynn. Um, before going to any other speakers, I do want to just call out that uh, staff has done a wonderful job itemizing um, all of the capital improvement plans, whether they're continuations or initiated projects. So um, we, we have provided the public a nice opportunity to really see on a, a pretty granular level where this is going. So um, as we go to other comments, um, anybody who has specific reference to those would be helpful and appreciated. Do you have any other? No, I don't see any other hands. Okay. Al, if I could just follow up on your comment about trying to make um, our projects more accessible to the public. We, uh, when you get a memo form and budget form, it tends to get a little drier. We do our best to rename the projects. We have internal nomenclature for a lot of these that actually has been revamped to try to be better communicators, even in the memo. But I'll just point to the fact that last month we put a lot of effort, or, and this month, on that uh, OSMP uh, master plan uh, webpage site to do a virtual open house in which you could toggle over um, projects that we're doing throughout the system. And if you toggle over a certain site, it will give you a full description of what that project is, what the goals for it are. So that is sort of something new that we experimented with this year. And, uh, and we'll be providing you with an update in our email update about the success and the visitation we had to that site. And Dan, where did you say the public can find that? Where they can look that look that up? Um, I think maybe Allison, do you have that on your? Yeah, that that's on our website. If you go to osmp.org on the home page, it says it, if you scroll down, it, there's a accordion kind of tabs there that will. One of them says um, keep tracking master plan progress or. Um, and sorry to cut you off, but osmp.org. Yep. Okay. Yeah, for those who haven't been on there, we, we really encourage you to do so. It's it's just a fabulous kind of virtual walk through our system and you get to know a little bit more about what we're doing this year. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight that because that might be the, yeah. the problem where they're not looking. Yeah. yeah, it's probably not part of our rhythm of thinking to think about that new 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 opportunity we put out there. Can you say where it is again? I went to osmp.org and I'm getting uh, something that's not what you're describing, Dan. So I don't, I don't know that it's very easy to find. Um, Karen, on that homepage, I'll go there too at the same time. If you scroll down. Um, I'm wondering if we could put something in the link just to. Do you need to spell out? OSMP or it is just this it's just OSMP.org and then under featured projects and pages the very first thing that has the OSMP logo that says tracking OSMP master plan progress so down below okay and then when you open that page do you see the banner across the top that says the purple banner across the top I do. Okay, and then if you're looking specifically for the projects map, it's the second bullet down. The interactive map, okay. Yeah. I, I know when you, you spend all this time developing these, it's obvious to all of you where this is, but sometimes it's really difficult for uh, regular ordinary people out here to find the kind of information you're describing. So thank you. Okay, with that, I think we have closed the public hearing and we will revert back to discussion. Um, I'd like to start for my point, and I said this at the last meeting, um, we really are making some very interesting and material investments in soil health, which I'm highly enthusiastic about. And I just wanna reiterate that I think that this is extremely innovative work and that a big part of the criteria of success in those projects is our recording of results and educating of other communities about what we're finding here. Um, and I just want to congratulate uh, you all for putting together what I think really actually is some of the most innovative work in the nation on that topic. 
and I look forward to sharing with the nation what we learned from it. Thanks, Hal. Does anybody else have some things they're interested in in final discussion here as we move towards a recommendation? Really? All right. Oh, Michelle. Hi. Yeah, just a quick um, comment and, and compliment to staff. I know this is really hard work and um, coming up with these capital improvement budgets are a work in progress and it's a rolling work in progress based on all the projects and the resources, the, including the human resources um, and per various uh, other hurdles that you have to go through to to get this body of work done over a long period of time. And I know your outlook is more than just one year. It's several years out and trying to plan that work. Um, also being new to the board and trying to, I, I, I did follow the master plan process really well, but certainly not specific projects. And I just feel like even um, in the short time that I've been exposed to the OSMP budget, you you all did a, a great job in, in educating me through the, the last um, three meetings that I've been part of. So thank you very much. I am in support of your proposal. One, one other thing I noticed, um, with uh, 65,000 slated for the fish passage design at New Dry Creek Carrier, and with us uh, looking to discuss another fish passage here, I was wondering if somebody can help me understand if we'll ever get sort of economies of scale on design with that. Is that a custom install on each and every place that it goes? Or do we have like a departmental template that we're using to pick up speed as we try to move fish around this habitat? Yeah, I can start and maybe Joan can chime in on the specifics. Uh, similar to the discussion last month around how we want to invest in the um, historic ag properties to get them ready for tenants. This is one where we started to fund like one per year. We started with Goodhue and then East Boulder Ditch and now we're looking at a third. Um, and so we are we are beginning to fund design on the third while we're still looking at construction for some of the previous. So my I anticipate that as we finish the others, we'll have improved cost estimates and looking at design as a percentage of overall cost. Uh, but around like design of fish passage, I would defer to John on that. Um, yeah, no, that's right, Lauren. Uh, I, I would just add that they're all different, Hal. Um, every single one of them is is a unique situation. And um, in the next agenda item, Don D'Amico was planning to talk a little bit about the bigger context and um, put that uh, put that kind of in a framework for you. Good. Great. Don, we'll, we'll look forward to a, a real good rundown on ladders and what we've learned. Great. Hey, looking forward to it. Thanks. Karen, Dave, Caroline, any um, final thoughts here? Karen. I, I'd like to move to approve and recommend that Planning Board and City Council approve an appropriation of four million nine hundred forty three thousand dollars in 2022 from the open space fund cip as outlined in this memorandum and recommend that four hundred and twenty eight thousand be appropriated from the city's lottery fund cip in 2022. great michelle i see you as a second wonderful then we will call the roll um, to approve this recommendation um, dave Kuntz. Approved. Caroline Miller. Yes. And I myself also enthusiastically approve. Um, thank you all for doing such a great job um, on this. And I do appreciate the three touches. Um, certainly uh, got to know many of these projects intimately over that process. So Lauren and Sam, thank you. Lauren, we're going to miss you dearly. Sam, we're <laughs> delighted to be getting to know you better. Um, and thank you so much for the hard work. All right. Thank, thank you. you. And you'll see them all in 30 days. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, I think we're ready to move to the second um, public hearing item tonight. And that is in regards to the Fist Passage. 
uh, in which we are doing a fish passage design, which includes a negotiation with the East Boulder Ditch Company, includes a rearrangement, if you will, of an existing easement. Um, so with that, I am going to turn things over to Don D'Amico, who could talk all things fist passage. Thanks, Dan. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to give an overview of the project um, that will hopefully explain why we're coming to you with this recommendation. And then um, I'll turn things over to Bethany, who will talk to you about the easement and about the uh, uh, disposal request itself. So, um, Leah, can you pull the presentation up, please? Great. Can everybody see that? Yep. Okay. Um, so, for the last couple of years, we've been working with the East Boulder Ditch Company and XL Energy. Um, was a major shareholder in the ditch company to plan, design, and install a fishway on the East Boulder Ditch Diversion to allow for the passage of fish in South Boulder Creek. Next slide. So to provide a little background, um, South Boulder Creek supports a really diverse community of native fish and also sport fish. We've been conducting surveys with Colorado Parks and Wildlife um, for a number of years and have identified about 15 species of fish within the project area. So we have a number of native species, including Plains top minnow, which is a state species of conservation concern, as well as other native, small native fish like creek chubs and long-nosed dace, long-nosed suckers, white suckers, a number of others. Um, and we've also uh, documented non-native sport fish like rainbow trout and brown trout, um, brown trout shown here in the lower right. Uh, next slide. So like a lot of our creeks, uh, South Boulder Creek has a number of concrete diversion dams that fragment aquatic habitat and effectively prevent upstream movement of fish and aquatic or other aquatic organisms. Next slide. So to, to address this, um, over the years, we've completed fish passage projects on other diversion structures on South Boulder Creek in this general area and including the South Boulder Canyon ditch shown here, next slide, and also the McGinn ditch. Um, and these projects, these two projects in particular have resulted in the defragmentation of more than four miles of aquatic habitat. Um, fish passage projects in, in general are a really efficient way of increasing the distribution abundance and diversity of especially native fish, which is an objective of OSMP um, throughout our system. Next slide. So looking at the project, um, the East Boulder Ditch Diversion is located about three tenths of a mile upstream or south of Baseline Road and the Bob Lake Trailhead and um, just north of the East Boulder Community Center Bridge on the Burke One property where that red star is in the middle there. Next. So the project includes relocating the existing head gate and diversion weir about 300 feet upstream of its current location. Uh, once we surveyed the creek and began collecting um, uh, survey and other data, more detailed data, we found that the height of the existing dam and the in-size, relatively in-size channel downstream of the dam would require a lot of fill to create a flat or gentle enough slope for native fish to kind of navigate upstream. So to make the project work within these existing conditions, we'll have to move the diversion upstream. One of the, one of the benefits of this is that it allows us to use a much more natural design with a minimum amount of concrete and will allow us to include um, some aquatic habitat features and some reworking of the actual channel to um, create some pools, more natural pools and riffles. And we can also incorporate some riparian restoration into the, um, into the project. You saw some, uh, the pictures of those pre two previous designs, which were done in, uh, well, more than, more than 10 years ago, 10 to 15 years ago. Um, 
there's a lot of concrete involved in those. And that was kind of the design, the, the industry standard, if you will, back then. But things have advanced since then. And we're moving to more of a natural design um, in creating structures that mimic and, and uh, both function and form mimic uh, more natural streams. Uh, next slide. So 90% um, design plans have been completed for the project and we're expecting, hoping to begin construction uh, late this year. The East Boulder Ditch Company has agreed to pay for half of the construction costs for the project, which are estimated to be about $500,000. And um, we're also working with the US Fish and Wildlife Service to um, secure some grant funding through their National Fish Passage Program. Uh, we got we got funding uh, from that program for a couple of our other uh, fish passage projects, one on Boulder Creek and, and another one on South Boulder Creek. And uh, we're, we're working with the city attorney's office, the, of course, the East Boulder Ditch Company and their attorneys um, on a draft agreement. We've, we've agreed the principle on the agreement that sets forth the roles and responsibilities of the two parties. And we're just um, kind of going through the, the final phases of that now. Uh, next slide. So if we move that, uh, move their head gate upstream, we'll need to provide the ditch company access to operate and maintain their, their new head gate and, and ditch. Um, this is going to require an easement modification that vacates a short section of easement shown here in red and uh, adds a new section of easement shown here in kind of that light green. So the light, the, the, uh, terminus of that light green section is where the new head gate will be and the, the end of that short red section on the creek is where the existing head gate is and their existing easement. So and the rest of the um, the rest of the easement shown in yellow will remain the same. Um, so to fill in some of the details about the easement uh, and also to uh, talk about the disposal of crep request, I'll uh, turn it over to Bethany. Thanks, Don. Um, can everybody hear me? All right, <laughs> I, I get now. Um, all right, so uh, Don uh, uh, mostly made my job pretty easy. I'm just going to wrap up. So as outlined in the memo and detailed by Don, um, this agenda item is consideration of a motion to approve and recommend that City Council approve the conveyance of a non-exclusive easement over a portion of the City's Burke One open space property to the East Boulder Ditch Company. Uh, the proposed easement recommended by staff is 37 feet wide and approximately 480 feet long. Um, in the, the graphic on the screen, that's the green line you are seeing. And this will uh, encumber approximately 0.5 acres of the Burke One property. Uh, in accordance with sections 175 and 177, Article 12 of our Boulder City Charter, an OSBT approval um, and recommendation to City Council is required to dispose of any open space land interests. The East Boulder Ditch has a company has an existing 37 foot wide easement over the Burke One property for maintenance, repair, and operation of the ditch, um, which you are seeing in yellow and red on your screen. Um, and because the existing head gate will be relocated, an amended uh, easement across open space land will be required by the, the ditch company. Um, as Don mentioned, the modifications would include the vacation and release of a portion of the existing easement. So, what you're seeing in red. Um, and the conveyance to the ditch company of a non-exclusive easement over OSMP, uh, open space land um, in compliance with the disposal procedures, um, as, as we've just discussed, uh, for the new ditch segment and access to the new head gate locations. Head gate location, excuse me. Uh, next slide. So with that, we'll just uh, circle back to the board for questions. Dave. Uh, I've got a question for Bethany and a question for Don. Uh, so Bethany, on the uh, easement access, uh, what kind of uh, specific access does that permit the ditch company to use? Uh, the ditch will be a buried pipe, and so the access will be, and it's and it's under an existing the existing trail, um, and so the 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 access will be over the um, within the thirty seven feet uh, and and the existing trail corridor. 
but oh that's great my but my question uh, fo is focused more on uh, you know vehicular kind of what what uh, oh okay what yeah, yeah. Actually allow them to do <laughs> right right um so uh, uh often dish companies do require um typically for a lot of their um their monitoring and their general operations they'll drive a a, a normal pickup truck it's a, a very occasional in nature um and they would be able to access over their their existing um access uh or their existing easement um as they have and then when they hit bobo link basically the or the south boulder creek um trail they would they would keep going over their easement to get to the head gate um again it's it's a disturbed surface because it is the it's an existing trail um as far as uh continued uh any kind of large maintenance activities they would they would return to us for um any kind of additional agreement that might be required um for expanded impacts or construction needs so they don't need a graded uh road or two track or anything like that to yeah. maintain the ditch yep. they don't need it but again right there it is it is an existing um basically a a, a, a crusher fine trail right right thanks uh, so don uh so what's going to happen to the old headgate structure that's a pretty massive structure and so what's going to happen to it uh that gets removed and that section of creek will be regraded to a more natural slope. So the, the wind walls, the um, diversion weir, um, the existing head gate, the only structure that'll be left there is the, the little um, corrugated metal pipe building, if you want to call it, that houses the instrumentation to monitor uh, uh, flow and diversion into the ditch. So does the fund, project funding include the removal of the existing headgate structure? Yes, it does. And uh, how is the contractor going to do that or how is that going to happen? Yeah, it'll be part of the, um, all of the excavation. You know, they're gonna have to do a fair amount of, of channel grading. They won't, they won't need to do much. They'll, they'll do very little, um, kind of grading outside of the existing channel other than to match kind of match grades with their new channel invert elevation. So yeah, all of that, all the old stuff comes out as, as part of the project. So and, there's quite a bit of, you know, concrete rubble hauled off site. So how is that going to happen or where, where is that going to occur? Well, we've got three options. One is to use a, um, and access that the ditch company currently uses off of Cherry Vale. Another option is to, uh, to use the existing greenways path, although that would require much smaller uh, vehicles, smaller dump trucks basically because of the weight limitations and the, the size of one of the greenways bridges there. And then the third option is to um, take the material out uh, on the west side of the creek out to Baseline Road across the Burke 2 property. Um, if we do that, that's going to require a lot of um, uh, protection of the existing ground, either steel plates or something like that. We've, we've, we've had situations in the past because that's, you know, that's wet meadow and fl flood irrigated partially in there. Um, right. part, part of it's dry, but there's enough of, of wet ground in there that we need to uh, protect that really well. It, it, the project will be done in the winter time, so that'll help with frozen ground. Um, but if we do go that route, um, yeah, there, there will be a, a big effort to protect existing vegetation in there. Are we going to use uh, steel plates for protection if we go the other way uh, on their existing easement? In the wet areas, definitely, yeah. Okay. And one, one final question, a personal note. Was that brown trout photo from South Boulder Creek? Yeah, yes it was. That was uh, during one of our electrofishing surveys with Parks and Wildlife. That, that was- it's amazing. it's amazing how big the fish- That's a big fish. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Hey, thanks. You got all the good questions in there, didn't you, Dave? <laughs> so, the most important one was the last. <laughs>
Uh, other trustees with uh, questions? Caroline? Yeah, thank you. Um, is Excel requesting anything specific for their company related to utilities, internet, broadband, um, in the discussion negotiations? I know you said that they were a big investor in the ditch. Um, is there anything that, that they want in the negotiations? Um, nothing, uh, well, I would say nothing beyond what, it, what the, uh, an, another shareholder would want. We, we've talked about in the, um, the, the uh, new water commissioner with the uh, um, Department of Water Resources, has been, she's new as of about a year ago, I think. She's been pushing for automation of both um, measurement and uh, water distribution. So one of the things that we have agreed to, and this fits in with the city's in-stream flow program and also open spaces, um, you know, uh, water management program is to automate um, flow measurements um, as part of this project. So it's, it's um, partially because it's just a good, good smart thing to do um, while we're, you know, while we're in there um, with equipment, it makes sense to, you know, do the construction and install the hardware necessary for, um, uh, for autom automation of measurement. And it's also um, required, although, you know, it's, we're not saying it's it's officially required as part of the the uh, gross reservoir expansion, but that that project requires um, that bypass flows to support and uh, uh, eliminate impact to the in-stream flow rights occurs on South Dakota Creek. So uh, everything everything that we do on South Boulder Creek, or I should say, a lot of the improvements that we'll be making on South Boulder Creek to any of these uh, diversion structures will include those things, um, particularly automation of measurement, but also if, um, you know, if, if it's cost effective and the ditch company can afford it, um, we're also pushing for automation of water delivery, which is basically that somebody can in their office and open and close head gates. Yeah, that was my next question. So the automation of measurements basically um, will also allow for um, variables and, and water flow, like you said, kind of at the, the touch of a button. Yes. Um, Don, I'm wondering, as we put artificial structure in the river, has there been any exploration of coloration above and beyond the natural color of concrete? Yeah, that's that's a great question. On the um, McGinn ditch, the, the second example that I showed, um, it, that was a sculpted concrete design. And so the surface of that, of that fishway was all, you know, just concrete like you'd pour in your driveway. Um, we had talked about uh, adding colorant to the concrete to make it look more natural. That picture was taken, I think, a couple of weeks after we finished. And um, we decided for a number of reasons to um, just leave it natural and let, um, you know, let it weather and let, you know, oxidation um, occur on the concrete and algae to grow and die. And, and it's, if you look at it now, it's, um, it, the color is similar to, well, in, in a lot of ways, it's similar to the, the rocks on the bottom on the bottom of the creek. It, it, it isn't that stark um, anymore. And, but, but that, like I said, that's a great question because we want, one of the things that we're, you know, one of the objectives is to make these projects look less engineered and, um, and more natural. And can can you offer the specific reasons you opted against coloration? Um, basically, it was a it was a cost issue. There was also some question about whether there was um, whether there were chemicals in colorant because the colorant there's two ways to color concrete. You probably know it's it's to mix the color in the wet concrete or to apply it to the surface of of freshly poured concrete. And so um, you know concrete leaches 
a fair amount. And so there was some discussion about whether it was appropriate to put artificial colorant chemicals into concrete that would leach that substance over time. I don't know that there was a lot of um, uh, evidence that that would happen, but when we when we looked at some other uh, concrete structures that have been poured recently, I think up on the South St. Brain, before we did that McGinn Ditch project, um, after four or five years, um, you know, the color the color color wasn't as as white or as light as when it was first poured. And the other just related to that is. Um, it looks like uh, the, the ladder runs quite a bit of concrete laterally from the primary channel. And I'm just looking to learn about why that much concrete to the lateral is required. Well, um, and you're asking about the McGinn ditch design? Is that uh, the, the picture that you showed us? Yeah. 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 So the, um, Leah, can you, can you show that one again? I can explain it better if we're, if we're looking at it. It's the, uh, can't remember what slide number it is. Uh, keep going down. Next one. So the, the fish way, um, there's, there's kind of two things, well, three things going on. That, that structure that's blocky with the wheel on top to the very left, um, that's the sand sluice that allows sediment to, um, get pulled out from the area right in front of the head gate. And you can kind of see that silver head gate farther to the right there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's one structure. The, the one to the right of that, that's flat across the top and kind of has the ripples coming down. That is the original concrete diversion weir that was there, similar to the one I showed that hadn't had any work done on it. And um, then the structure to the right is actually the fishway. So the, you know, making it, it's so long because that's what we had to do to make it flat enough or general, gentle enough um, to allow the passage mostly of native fish. You know, the little natives, they don't jump like salmon like you see in the movies mm -hmm. and stuff like that. They just kind of wiggle their way up and they have, you know, they have little bodies and I assume little muscles and, and so they, they are affected by, by slope and velocity and also um, you know, uh, structure like rocks and stuff that form little trees and places that they can rest on their way up. Because that's about, I think that's about a 90, a 90 to 110 foot ramp there. Yep. And, um, you know, they, they measure swimming efficiency in native fish by burst speed and then endurance. So how, how fast can you go over what length of time or you know, a what distance? Yeah. And so that was the design that allowed for it to be flat enough and also rough enough um, that fish, the, the little fish could make it up there. So, so my question is, um, Don, when you're moving into an area that doesn't have an existing concrete structure like this one, can the flat section between the ladder and the metal gate be constructed of natural materials boulders, rocks, and, and something less obtrusive. Yes, and that's that's exactly what we're doing on the East Boulder Ditch. Um, but I will say, I, I haven't seen any, um, any existing or old diversion structures that aren't uh, concrete weirs, concrete dams. Um, they, they just, uh, they, there are, uh, push-up dams that where bulldozers get in the creek every spring and they they pile up gravel and make an area that that um, raises the water elevation to the the height of the head gate and allows water to be diverted that way but all the ones we have in our area are all these um, head gate sand sluice diversion weir type setups okay I appreciate that. I don't think that big uh, brown trout, it doesn't want to be over concrete up there by the oxygenated water. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate your, your rundown, Don. It's a non-native fish, Hal. It doesn't know what it wants. <laughs> <laughs> it wants to get away from the big brown trout is what it wants. <laughs> yeah. Okay, anything else? 
Is anybody willing to lift them, Dave? If we're we ready. need to go to the public uh, oh, yeah, um, me. hearing. Yep. Um, so, Allison, would you mind uh, opening our public hearing for us? Yes, and Dorothy Cohen had registered to speak in advance, so let me find her now. Okay, so Dorothy, you should uh, be able to unmute yourself and just state your first and last name. My name is Dorothy Cohen, and I want to speak on South Boulder, um, the university. And I feel oh, like Dorothy, um, uh, this, this moment is for a discussion of the uh, FISH project. Oh, okay. We're, we're, uh, yeah, we, yeah, we, we're, Dorothy, I can, add you, I can add you to the other list. And what time will that start? Um, it looks like uh, we'll probably begin discussing it here within 10 minutes, and uh, I would estimate maybe 40 minutes for potentially till public hearing. Okay, we have one other hand, Lynn Siegel. Lynn, you can unmute yourself now. Lynn Siegel, yeah. Um, this is so cool. It reminds me of my mom's storybook about the mother fish teaching the little fish how to get up the stream um and it also and my mother died when she was 38 of plutonium from rocky flats i believe she was uh, downstream of the um 57 fire at rocky flats but um the springs to mind um my plan for south boulder creek uh for you know the the issue of fish and dams is generally not good you know i'm from the pacific northwest where we're trying to breach dams to help the salmon you know to a salmon a dam is a cousinart it's not a friendly place so um the idea of of diverting water downstream of this area from the south boulder creek to mitigate um the flood risk um would change um, from my discussion with friends about rip raft, and if, I hope I'm saying that right, um, you know, rechannelizing the um, the South Boulder Creek down to Bo Main Boulder Creek and out of town, and um, I wonder if that would change any of this plan for these um, fish runways. But I'm um, also Don, Don when Don was speaking at first, and he said native fish. And then I thought I heard it say working fish, work fish. I didn't know that we had worker fish, <laughs> but that's kind of interesting. Maybe we can um, get some good work out of them. Um, but in any case, um, your plan looks um, really good. And I'm glad to see that over time, it gets to be more natural. Um, that's always good. And I also am reserved about putting colorant into cement and uh, just for, you know, an appearance, uh, it seems like kind of a, a natural thing to, to use, but looks good to me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> I don't see any other hands. Okay, so we will revert back now and forgive me, you know, uh, a lot of different steps to these evenings. We're now back to discussion if uh, people are looking to engage in that. Dave. Uh, and I'll just clarify Lynn Siegel's uh, observation. Uh, Don actually said it was a sport fish, not, not a work fish. So, <laughs> so sport fish are basically non-native fish. Rainbow or brown trout in this case. Any other uh, points of discussion? <laughs> okay, well, we are uh, seeking to move towards the staff recommendation here. Does anybody feel like lifting a motion? Dave? Uh, I'd like to make the motion. Wonderful. Would you mind reading it aloud? I will. The Open Space Board of Trustees approves a motion to approve and recommend that City Council approve 
the conveyance of a non-exclusive easement over a portion of the Burke One open space property pursuant to the disposal, disposal procedures of Article 12, Sections 175 and 177 of the Boulder City Charter to the East Boulder Ditch Company for the East Boulder Ditch Fish, Fish Passage Project. Thank you. I will second the motion. So, uh, Karen Holwig. We can't hear you, sorry. Yes. Yes. Caroline Miller. Yes. And Michelle? Yes. Wonderful, so that's unanimous. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Don, for leading us through all that. Um, certainly illuminating, interesting work that's happening there. Thanks. That's great. Great, okay. thanks, Bethany. Thanks, Don. And uh, thank you, trustees. And we'll move on to our third and final um, uh, public hearing item. And, uh, and that is the con uh, continuation of a discussion of a draft resolution um, uh, that sets forth uh, uh, some conditions of disposal. Um, I just wanted to uh, 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 take one minute and John Potter would just like to take one or two minutes to set some context for the discussion for those members of the public that may be joining this for the first time or just rejoining the conversation after be a year or two of, of not following it specifically. But how we got to this meeting and to this point um, uh, as most uh, folks know that have been tracking the project uh, beginning in, in 2018, when we got word for, uh, and clarification from CDOT that uh, they are unwilling to uh, support certain of the flood, uh, flood wall uh, um, systems within the right of way. Uh, and the only place at that point that this concept uh, flood wall could go would be on open space. Our board has been, and staff has been intimately involved in, in tracking the project and discussing the project and very much involved in the details to the point of which since, uh, since that uh, uh, no one's that uh, open space lands would be directly impacted uh, in 2018, this particular board has had uh, over a dozen uh, particular meetings in which the subject of South Boulder Creek flood mitigation or the associated annexation project with South has been discussed. So a, a number of meetings throughout the years over the last three years. Um, where uh, for this particular discussion, this started to bud uh, by a desire of the board uh, in which at the February study session, they expressed an interest in first providing some feedback to council uh, regarding the annexation project, but then also daylighting the fact that they would like to move to a more detailed discussion like will like happen last month and again this month about specific terms and conditions uh, set forth for disposal. And after that February meeting, then there be uh, was subsequent conversations in April and then last month in which last month uh, uh, debuted the idea of the resolution. Um, and so um, it has, uh, we've been sort of at a, the board's been on about a three or four month journey with this particular resolution concept. And that brings us forward to tonight. So I hope that that just sort of, that brief timeline helps to track members of the public of, you know, why tonight and, and how did we get here? So that provides that brief overlay. And then we thought uh, maybe John could also do some very brief context setting uh, for those that uh, may not be tracking this on a daily basis. So uh, before we turn it over to the board, uh, John will just introduce uh, a, a few background slides. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Dan. John Potter here. Leah, could you pull up that that those four brief slides? Really, just wanted to uh, share with everyone uh, kind of where the location is of these uh, pro properties, these parcels that we'll be discussing at, uh, tonight. Um, if you could look at this map here that's on the screen, US 36 is running diagonally. Um, across the screen, South Boulder Road above that. And then uh, this is an area between US 36 and State Highway 93. Uh, the, the CU South property is 
the white uh the area in gray kind of to the to to the left of that orange arrow that says site the green properties are the open space properties currently uh open space lands in the uh state natural area um the van vliet south parcel is the one where um, there's discussion about a five acre piece of land that is necessary for the flood mitigation project. It has nothing to do, that five acres has nothing to do with CU. It has nothing to do with the annexation or CU South. It has to do with the flood mitigation project. And if you, and it's generally in that area where the arrow is pointing, the orange arrow points says site. And if you go to the next slide, Leah, is a close up of that area. And you can see here, you can see where US 36 is. You can also see a um, kind of a, a, gr a grayed out area that says five acres. And that five acre piece of ground will be discussed tonight during this. And I just wanted everyone to see where that is. And those who have been following the project know that like this is generally the area that was in the long-term environmental impact statement for the expansion of US 36. Um, it's, it's an area that's already been, been looked at for potential future use of the highway, um, but now it is being proposed to be used instead for um, flood, flood mitigation, and in particular, a flood wall, a thin flood wall that would run right along the edge of the, um, the north side of that five acres. Next slide. Another uh, parcel that um, will be discussed tonight is a, an area of 119 acres. Now this area actually is on the CU South property. It is the area that's also known as the open space other land. It is um, not part of the, um, it's, it's not part of what's needed for the, the flood project directly or for um, the CU development area. It is a separate area that uh, was um, uh, designated during the uh, Boulder Valley comp plan revision as open space other. And, and the final slide. Finally, I know this is all, this is a very complicated project and there's lots of moving pieces. And I just wanted to quickly throw a picture of the current um, concept or the the project design for the flood mitigation project. And it kind of shows the dynamics of all the land ownerships in, and everything in here. And in this, you can see that area that um, I was showing earlier uh, with the orange arrow, that um, now a, a red line that's marked flood wall, that is the Northern part of that, that five acres and the main piece of land on open space property that would be necessary to do the flood project, um, as well as the area in blue, uh, just immediately south of that, which is what would flood during a hundred year event um, on open space. Then uh, the 119 acres, again, is um, the area marked OSO uh, below that. And um, it, it also shows the existing levy that's on the CU property on this map, which uh, may be referred to tonight. And I, I just want to show everyone where that was. And um, and yeah, and so the, and the main project, as you can see, would be constructed with a, an earthen dam on the CU South property if the annexation is able to happen. So I think that's pretty much all I wanted to do for context setting, Hal, uh, unless you have any questions or anything else you'd like me to address on that. No, I, I think that's uh, very helpful, John. Um, I'm just going to make a brief comment and then hand it over to Michelle to talk about um, the committee's work. Um, the, the comment that I want to make is just so members of the public are clear um, that this has been an iteration on this document that has um, seen a number of passes, and it originally began with the core motivation that if we were to contemplate doing a disposal for this project with the public's work to public works department, that we would want to have the same level of um, consideration, robust uh, homework, and uh, 
care that would go into any disposal that we would make with any third party. And that it would not be preferenced in some way simply because it was an intercity departmental transaction. That sort of uh, originally came as we reviewed documents of prior disposals with third parties and we began to contemplate how to make sure such a transaction would have that same rigorousness. Um, the document that you are looking at tonight has been through a committee process and uh, we're going to have a robust discussion of it this evening and we look forward to he hearing all of your comments. And so um, before we move forward, I want to give it, the, uh, give it over to Michelle to talk about her experience about what happened in committee um, with staff members in the city attorney's office that led us to where the iteration stands as presented in this evening's packet. Thank you, Hal. Um, I want to thank my colleagues and my, my fellow, basically my fellow trustees for creating the, the subcommittee. Um, and during the last month's business meeting, really to pursue a collaborative process, and which, um, as Hal mentioned, resulted in what is in the packet that you see today, um, labeled May 28th, 21 committee draft resolution. I especially want to thank Hal, who is not only crushing it as our new chair, don't blush Hal, um, but as a, a committee member, he was very patient with me as I get up to speed on this particular issue. Our subcommittee included John Potter and our city attorney, Janet Michaels, Hal, and me, obviously. And the four of us met for many hours um, over the course of, I think, four meetings that I jotted down here on my calendar. Um, and um, Janet joined us for one of the meetings on her vacation. Um, there were also countless other correspondences that happened um, in the drafting of this document. And I'm sure there were other, I actually I know that there were other meetings that happened with staff regarding technical issues um, and questions that Hal and I brought up. Um, you know, while Hal and I didn't always agree with each other and there wasn't always agreement between the four of us, we always found a way to have a healthy and deep debate. And, and in, in the end, I, I, um, I learned a ton by going through these debates with super knowledgeable, knowledgeable people. Um, in the end, I think we, you know, everyone made compromises in the spirit of collaboration, and I really appreciated this process. Um, so what you see in the process is a product of many hours of, of hard work. Um, there are many things in the document that I, I certainly wouldn't have come up with myself. Um, but I understand where my colleagues are coming from and where the community is coming from, even if I don't agree with them. My approach during this, this uh, committee process was to strike a balance for the sake of our community. And I, I really hope that you all see that we've done that here and, um, and, and trust that we, we work our darndest to, to come up with something that we thought was the best for the community. And I, I thought it was a great experience. Thank you for making space for this to happen. Hal, do you wanna add anything? Yeah. Or correct wonderful. anything I said? <laughs> No, no, I, I, I really appreciate all the sentiments there. And I also found it um, to be a, a great opportunity to dig deeper into this issue. Um, my comments on this uh, would be um, sort of in, in order to facilitate a conversation, especially with the public. Um, in my mind, conceptually, this document can be divided into three segments. And that's how the committee talked about it. The first is basically recitals, and those are sections of the document that begin with the word whereas. Then there is a section that we refer to as the mechanism, which is the section that begins with the words therefore. And finally, there is a list of conditions that essentially is an amalgamation of, uh, pr of prior board resolutions and business that we've heard over uh, many years actually at this point and multiple open space board of trustees that represents um, what this board has felt is uh, important required as far as environmental mitigation um, for any potential disposal that we might look at. And as we um, basically, we're gonna have a very robust discussion. I'm very much looking forward to doing that in the public eye. I'm uh, very much looking forward to hearing all the comments of the public. What I do think um, would be helpful is for people to understand that the staff made a decision that the prior version that the committee worked on of this document 
had language that was so close to dealing with disposal, it was very important that we provide public notice and hence the reason you have all joined us tonight. I do think personally, um, given, given where this document is, it is unlikely there will be any determinant action this evening. What would be extremely helpful from the public would be actual fundamental and technical input on these points as we drive towards this goal of creating a draft document or at least a, a series of recitals and conditions that are um, going to exemplify that same rigorousness that we would use with any uh, third party for an intergovernmental transfer. And then I think you're gonna hear a very significant and meaningful debate about what we're calling the mechanism part of this document. And so those are the various things I'd like to set up, just offering what I think would be very helpful to the board and staff to hear from members of the public. And then finally, I would look to the board to say, in my opinion, um, are, uh, there may well be clarifying questions. And if there are, I think both Michelle, myself, John, or other committee members would be delighted to take those clarifying questions. However, if you'd prefer to reserve more time for discussion, I think we could also move into public hearing and then return for a more blended approach to questions and discussion. Um, what would be the prerogative of the board? Dave? I guess how to kind of move this conversation along. Um, I will say uh, personally, I have appreciated the subcommittee's work. I think that uh, you definitely uh, tightened up the original, the initial uh, draft, uh, considerably improved it. And so uh, I, I appreciate definitely the uh, work that went into that. And I think it's a, a much clearer and better uh, document at this point. Uh, I will say though that uh, some of the board members are a little concerned in, as you referenced, the kind of the change of the direction or focus of the language. And, and so in that regard, um, as you know, uh, Karen Holig and I have come up with a revision of the subcommittee's revision uh, to uh, inform the conversation as we uh, move along uh, tonight. And, I think the, the best way to understand the differences are basically, um, I think the subcommittee's focus has been on uh, assuming or uh, accepting that the disposal decision will be made up front. And so then there are certain things that need to happen um, as a result of the commitment to that decision. Um, I think Karen and I, on the other hand, uh, think that the disposal decision awaits uh, both much further uh, contemplation as well as uh, time before it is made. And so as the initial uh, draft resolution um, identified or focused on, we are concerned that the annexation effort include whatever uh, conditions or contingencies that uh, need to be considered for a disposal question. So um, it, the, the conversation kind of has two heads. Um, one is whether it's, uh, it, it's important that the, the disposal decision be committed to before further discussion or whether in fact further discussion is necessary before the disposal decision. And so, uh, I would like to make sure that the uh, revised, the revision to the <laughs> revision of the uh, subcommittee is also on the table uh, for consideration as we go through the evening's discussion. And, and I certainly think we will. And within that, I also hear a bit of a, what I'll describe as a clarifying question. You should also know it was not our committee's viewpoint or expectation that this resolution presented by the committee would be adopted this evening. We believe that it was our mandate to improve the document and to continue it in draft phasing. 
So, so I think that's the important only, to understand. The only response I would say to that, Helen, and I do understand that, is that um, unfortunately, I think as far as in the this context of a disposal decision, um, is the complicating variables of the annexation agreement negotiations. And so um, the disposal decision has kind of a, a totally different discrete time frame than, uh, than otherwise would happen because the annexation negotiations are moving along and expected to uh, wrap up uh, sometime this summer or shortly. And the concern I think that the board has is that, um, that the disposal decision not be premature before there are commitments uh, as far as the uh, mitigation of environmental impacts uh, based on such a decision in the future. And, and um, Dave, I agree with that very much. I think, as a matter of fact, the entire board is unanimous that we undertook an expedited schedule on this project in order to be very clear um, because there are some items that are run abreast of annexation and may need to be addressed during annexation that we wanted those conditions very much to be forthright as they had come in prior motions of the board that we felt might be obscured by their distance from each other over time. So to that regard, that that was a goal of the project, I, I believe we're unanimously agreed. Yeah, so the bottom line I think is that the, is the proverbial card in front of the beleaguered horse um, in some of our minds. And so what we have to determine tonight is, you know, in order to get a decision, uh, do things have to be done first or can we, can, or in order to get the outcome we want, uh, should we commit to a decision up front? Um, and I think that those are the two differences that, that we're looking at is, you know, when is the decision most appropriate and timely? Yes, and, 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 and I'll just repeat, I think members of the committee see a reversion to additional committee work as being a perfectly acceptable outcome of this evening's work efforts in the public eye. So um, I, I, I basically, we're gonna have this robust debate um, and we're, we're gonna talk about the mechanism and we're gonna talk about all that. Um, and I, I really actually look forward um, to it, especially appreciate you being here, Janet, to help us with that. Caroline, I see your hand up. Hey, thank you. Um, so I hear everything that Dave said and I hear everything that you said, um, and, and I know I'm repeating both of you, um, but the idea of putting this much work this quickly to be done so that it is able to be presented for annexation. I just feel um, a bit concerned that we'll end tonight with just a discussion um, as opposed to moving forward and then what we need to provide at annexation will not be there. Um, and, and I think that I was a little confused um, because when I saw this in the packet, I assumed that we were going to uh, make decisions tonight, but are we going to say we'll see at the end and, and vote if we're going to make a decision or are, are we saying that that tonight is just, a, I'm just, I just feel like I'm confused. And before we get started, I just want, I know that's what Dave was kind of just asking and you were just saying, but I still feel like I don't know the answer. Yeah, I think that has yet to be determined. And certainly the public's input during the hearing, I would hope would be influencing trustees to that end. So, um, Karen, yeah. We can't hear you, Karen. Karen, you're muted. We still can hear you. There we go. Um, there was a motion at the end of our last meeting to table the uh, draft that we were considering at our May meeting. And that draft had in it a different mechanism than the committee's draft has in it. Um, and I think that's what Dave was referring to when he said he wanted both 
mechanisms on the table mm -hmm. uh, for discussion. And as long as, as um, there's board agreement that we need to be considering both of those mechanisms tonight, um, I'm good with where we're going. My personal preference is to end this meeting with a vote also. Uh, so I just wanna state for the record that that's where I am. Okay, I, um, thank you, Karen. I do, I do think uh, this discussion, we are gonna hear from each and every trustee in any format they choose to present. The more specific um, and directed our comments can be, the more robust the, the conversation will get. That's fantastic. Certainly everybody will be heard in full. And if it's um, okay with the board, I actually believe um, before we engage in this rigorous discussion, that it would be helpful to hear from members of the public who, um, who have seen this document and have views that they would like to share and um, that they will be benefited uh, by hearing our debate. And um, perhaps it is a little helpful to frame up the differences in mechanism are very subtle um, and essentially one of them actually, the, the, the committee's document contains what we through the work of staff thought draft language that would actually execute action by the board would look like. And we wanted to present it back to the board for your feedback. It wasn't that we were seeking uh, th the idea that it is perfect or that it is what we want to see adopted, but we do think that it is more directed and action-oriented language. There will also be a mechanism on the table that um, works a bit more in the, uh, so, works in slightly different ways. And this was why it was confusing because the staff said it was so close to a disposal that they felt a public notice was required. And so um, I don't know if that's gonna help the public really parse, a lot of what the discussion will be this evening. Nonetheless, um, the committee feels that what we did was make material progress, not only in adding protections to the document and deep consideration about things that had been missed from the original document, but um, we also addressed some of staff's specific technical concerns and we began to explore language that we felt um, would actually function as a single action if and when this board wanted to move in that direction or to be rejected. Um, but it, it had to its advantage at least what we felt additional clarity about the intention of the board. So um, I'm very proud of the work that we did as far as moving this document down the road uh, in many ways. I have heard numerous um, very meritorious criticisms already of the newest draft and we'll review those in detail. But once again, if it's okay with folks, I think we should go to a, a nice public hearing period and then return to really get into the, that um, specific technical language. Does that work for everybody? Yes, Michelle. I'm just asking how that somewhere in there, we just uh, build in a little bit of a break. Yes. Um, however, that, however that works out. Why, why don't we do the public hearing and then go for a break? How many people, Allison, do we have signed up? 20 signed up in advance. Okay, so that suggests approximately 40 minutes. Can people go 40 minutes without a break? Yep. Okay, tremendous. Um, Allison, if you wouldn't mind queuing us up to hear from the public, um, that'd be okay. wonderful. Okay, so we'll start with this list of everyone who signed up in advance and then if you if anyone has joined the meeting and would like to speak they, you can raise your hands uh, as well and we'll we'll follow up with you once we get through this list first. Uh, we'll start with Brookie Gallagher and then on deck will be Margaret Lacombe. Let me find Brookie Gallagher. Okay, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, and then just start with your first and last, and your first and last name, please. Okay, my name is Brookie Gallagher, 
and I would like to encourage board members to be guided by the carefully developed charter for open space, which provides very specific guidelines for appropriate use or disposal of open space lands. As you know, the stated mission of OSMP is to preserve and protect the natural environment and land resources that characterize Boulder for current and for future generations. It does not say that OSMP should preserve and protect lands except when it's inconvenient or except when someone wants to do something else with the property. The rare and valuable wetlands and tall grass prairie on the land in question deserve preservation. They're valuable resources that will help Boulder in our commitment to address global warming. I have to believe that the charter was developed to support and guide the board and the community through challenging decisions that would be inevitable, such as where we're at right now. These decisions are not isolated and they have significant future implications. The charter section 176 states very specific and limited purposes for the open space land. And, um, I'm sorry, let me, <laughs> I'm just going to pick out one of them. Um, paragraph E says, for shaping the development of the city, limiting urban sprawl and disciplining growth. So the use of open space in any way to contribute to the annexation of CU South, which it's very, this decision is quite connected to, um, to develop a campus equivalent in size to the current main campus is the exact opposite of this open space charter mandate. Um, the decision regarding disposal should not be an isolated decision. It's very consequential. I know you folks have a very difficult decision to make in your recommendation to city council, you, but you also have very clear directives in the OSMP charter that I hope will give you the support to make the best decision. Thank you. Sorry to run over a minute. Thank you, Take care. appreciate it. Okay, next up we have Margaret. I'm searching for you now. Sorry, there's there are a lot of people on tonight. Okay, Margaret, you should be able to unmute yourself and on deck will be Deborah Biasca. Okay, I'm Margaret LeCompte. I live in South Boulder. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you. I'd like to urge the Open Space Board of Trustees to reject the resolution before you recommending disposal of a piece of city owned taxpayer funded open space to build a flood wall along Highway 36 in the South Boulder Creek floodplain. First, permissible uses for uh, purposes for use of open space land are clearly specified in the city charter and that charter specifically forbids the use of open space for flood mitigation. Secondly, more important, this disposal is pre premature. The city has as yet no fully developed conceptual design or even the permits needed to build this project. <clears throat> Recommending disposal of any open space when there's no concrete plan for blood mitigation or even what and how much land is needed would be very ill-advised. Third, this, this specific document in front of you makes no sense whatsoever. Its first section is completely irrelevant to, almost contradicted by the last section. The first, the whereas section, lists many concerns about possible harm to wetlands in this property, threats to endangered species, adverse impacts to groundwater flows, difficulties in remediating harm, and a myriad of other concerns to be considered if a disposal is to be con contemplated. The second part recommends that the disposal be approved. However, astoundingly, the third section describing what the city must do in exchange for disposal addresses not a single one of the environmental issues or even the impossibility of remediating damage caused by the flood wall that are, were raised by OSBT. So I don't see this as a compromise that is good for the community. It's rather a giveaway of precious open space for a purpose it was never tended to fulfill and without adequate data, background data. I urge you to reject this resolution because OSBT has been asking the city to respond to the, the concerns addressed in the whereas's, but the city for three years has not responded. 
Thanks Thank very much. Thank you very much, Margaret. <clears throat> Okay, Deborah Biasca, and then on deck will be Mary Scott. Deborah, can you unmute yourself? Yes, I think you okay. can hear me now. Yep, thank you. I'm Deborah Biasca. I live in Boulder, and I too urge you to deny the request for disposal of city open space at CU South. It is beyond your legal mandate, violates the public trust, and there are other avenues for protecting one neighborhood from flood risk. First, your mission statement requires you to preserve and protect Boulder's characteristic natural environment, to sustain the natural values of the land for current and future generations. This mission guides every action you take, including disposal. Next, Article 12, Sections 170 to 177 of the City Charter constrain your duties and require disposal to comply with your mission and the Charter, including Section 176, which lists only eight purposes for use of open space land. Your website's public statement against disposing of mineral rights correctly recognizes this exact requirement. I was going to address three of the use requirements, but one has been adequately spoken to by Brookie, um, the paragraph E about limiting urban sprawl. Um, secondly, paragraph G authorizes use of open space to prevent encroachment on floodplains. Ipso facto, it does not authorize this board to support encroachment on the floodplain and to provide for it as this disposal clearly does. The final paragraph of section 176 specifically requires that all uses of open space must serve the land itself, not other lands. And I was um, pleasantly surprised to hear the previous proposal for disposal for the, the stream which does meet that requirement. This proposal does not. If these restrictive purposes in 176 are ignored, the Open Space Board would keep them from selling our open space to the highest bidder for any reason, robbing citizens of the treasured natural spaces for what we have paid so dearly. Lastly, there are other options for Fraser Meadows. I think my time is up and I would urge you to read my written comments, which I submitted on that topic prior to the start of this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah. Mary Scott, you can unmute yourself and up next will be Mike Marsh. Mary Scott, I live in Mary, we're having a little trouble hearing you. Is there any way you can get closer to the microphone? Hmm. Is this better? Much better. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for restarting. Appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to read the mission statement, which I know you guys are aware of, but it helps me to ground with that. Open space and Mountain Parks Department preserves and protects the natural environment and land resources that characterize Boulder. And that's what I want to focus on for my, my minute, which is characterizing Boulder, fostering appreciation of our, and the natural value of the land for current and future generations. That's my kind of my big piece when we look at the charter, which reflects the mission statement, um, the core purpose to preserve natural areas characterized by or including terrain, flora, fauna that are unusual, spectacular, scientifically valuable or unique um, and rare examples of native, native species. And that is indeed what we have at CU South at this beautiful piece of land. I, I feel when I was reflecting on the role that you guys have, each of us who is a citizen and on a board, we are the you know, the elders and the people who are preparing for the seven generations to come. And given that this land and this city, this whole area is Native American land, I really urge us to not just look at this intellectually, but look at this as a, a heritage site um, for our future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. 
Okay, Mike Marsh, you can unmute yourself and then up next will be Dorothy Cohn. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Good evening. I asked the board to not dispose of any of the Van Vliet open space. Something I'm really concerned about is the impact of a dam on the groundwater flow through the site. Groundwater is one of the least understood aspects of hydrology. And the city of Boulder still does not have a single groundwater hydrologist on staff. Groundwater moves in mysterious ways beneath the surface of the land, but it does marvelously beneficial things such as feeding the wet meadows on the open space near CU South. But for a flood dam to hold back flood waters, it will require drilling piers and caissons all the way down to the bedrock. Concrete footers will have to be poured underneath the dam, at which point we will be altering the movement of groundwater through the site. Groundwater, when impeded, seeks alternate routes. Just like surface water, it has to go somewhere and will typically seek the path of least resistance. Not even experts can perfectly predict this path. But the dam running most of the way across the open space will prevent the path of will represent the path of most resistance, which may mean that the groundwater finds an entirely different path, one that could be a long way from the site. If that happens, you may very well lose the groundwater current that feeds the wet meadow around the property. So I offer the sobering cautionary note that a vote to dispose of the one to five acres near the location of the dam may in reality mean the unintended disposal, so to speak, of many more acres of wet meadow. Oh, the acres will still be there, but you may not be able to recognize them because what was once a lush, pristine, highest value wet meadow may be a dried out, parched, permanently altered landscape. As a condition of disposal, you should require a guarantee that the dam will not alter the groundwater flow in a way that's harmful to the rest of the site. And I don't think that such can be guaranteed even by experts. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mike. Dorothy, you can unmute yourself and up next will be Kim and Harmon. My name is Dorothy Cohen and I live in South Boulder and I've lived here for over 40 years. Utilization of land shaping the development of the city and creating all urban sprawl is not the best use of the property. The city already has two campuses. Creating sprawl into South Boulder does not make sense, especially in the middle of a floodplain, which has endangered species, riparian habitat, and Zurich mesa grass, mesa tall grass in this area. Spending money to fill up the land and take all those trips to, um, to bring dirt in does not make sense at all. The city taxpayers would be, the money the taxpayers would be spending is, would be better used in other ways. I do not recommend that the city uh, continue pursuing CU South. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Okay, come in. Okay, you can unmute yourself and up next will be Raymond Bridge. Okay, hello. Um, I wanna thank you for taking the time to listen to us, the citizens of Boulder. You know, 2020 was a crazy year, a year that everyone and their brother discovered Boulder County's open space. Parking at trailheads was non-existent due to the influx of people from other counties who could park for free. But there was always CU South open space where I could retreat and not be inundated with people. In the winter, it was a happy place to go skate skiing as we joked at sea level. Such an absolutely breathtaking setting. If you decide to give CU our open space, where will, we, where will we all go? CU South serves a valuable need in spreading out the number of recreators within the open space system. And now that I see where the wall is going to be, um, putting a flood wall next to the bike path will take away from what is now a beautiful vista. So please honor the charter, especially section 176 C, preservation of land for passive recreational use such as hiking, photography, or nature studies, and if specifically designated bicycling, horseback riding, or fishing, and I'll add skiing, as well as H, preservation of land for its aesthetic or passive recreational value 
and its contribution to the quality of life of the community. I trust you all to do the right thing. When you acquired this property, there was obviously a reason for wanting to preserve it. Why give it away and let the land be damaged? Doesn't make sense to me. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Okay, Ray, you can unmute yourself and up next will be Leslie Glus Glustrom. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good evening, trustees. I'm Raymond Bridge, 435 South 38th Street in Boulder, speaking on behalf of the Boulder County Audubon Society. We strongly oppose disposal of this property at this time. Doing that right now would be inappropriate and unacceptable. We believe that you would be failing in your responsibilities as trustees to do so at this time. There are dozens of issues that need to be resolved before disposal will be appropriate. Given the time constraint, I'll mention only two, one technical and the other procedural. With regard to the technical issue, the proposed flood wall would intercept groundwater flow that sustains the ecosystems of the tall grass prairie habitat conservation area, the adjoining designated natural area, and the South Boulder Creek State Natural Area. As a first step in the design of the flood wall, the Utilities Department undertook doing a groundwater study. As yet, that study has not been made public, so there is absolutely no way that engineers and hydrologists can evaluate flood wall designs or their impacts on the natural areas you have the responsibility to protect. Hence, the public does not have the information needed to comment on this proposal, proposed disposal. It is not ready to be considered by this board. Second, the proposed resolution refers to replacement land to be transferred from CU. There is currently no annexation agreement, so this is supposed replacement land is still completely speculative. Given the many complications regarding the annexation, including a likely citizens initiative ballot measure on the ballot this November, it makes no sense to claim that we have reached the threshold where disposal is appropriate. Again, this disposal is not ready for prime time. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Leslie, you can unmute yourself and up next is Peter Mayer. Hi, this is Leslie Glustrom. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Leslie Glustrom. I live in Boulder and have lived here for over 25 years. I also want to strongly oppose the disposal of this land. I understand that the Open Space Board of Trustees has been put in a really difficult position. I understand that Fraser Meadows is really, you know, they're scared, I get it. Um, I also understand that CU is being incredibly stupid and stubborn, frankly. Uh, they hardly qualify themselves as an institution of higher education to build into a floodplain at this stage in our what we know about climate change, it makes no sense whatsoever. You've heard a lot about the charter and I'll just highlight the part of the charter that says that open space land section 176 is to be preserved and retained and then paragraph B for preservation of water resources in their natural or traditional state. So clearly disposal at this point would not serve that Last night, we had a long city council meeting where the city council said over and over and over and over again how important it was that we did everything in the city with an eye to its impact both on climate change and what climate change is going to mean for the city. Building in a floodplain is, I'm just going to, it's just darn stupid. And I don't want to live in a community that does darn stupid things. Also, we've all paid for this open space. There's no reason. I appreciate the hard work that the committee did. Please don't move ahead until you absolutely have to. You've laid the foundation. You can just stop now, but there should be a strong statement that we should not be disposing of land that I and everyone else paid for, which the charter is very clear about and which would support a terrible option. There are options for Fraser's Meadows, options for CU, Let's use those. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leslie. Peter, you 
can unmute yourself now on deck is Rosemary Hagerty. Hi, this is Peter Mayer. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, this is Peter Mayer. I'm the co-chair of Plan Boulder. It's the organization that helped create the open space program. So, you know, the combination of CU's insistence that it receive developable land and the political will of the city to move forward in flood mitigation at all costs have combined really to com create a complete denial of climate science and basic flood mitigation principles. I would like to remind the open space charter calls for utilization of land to prevent encroachment on floodplains. The disposal of the land you are considering tonight will enable encroachment on the South Boulder Creek floodplain. It is exactly antithetical to the statement in the charter. Utilization of land to prevent encroachment on the floodplain. So the disposal tonight is all conditioned upon the annexation which then includes filling in the floodplain. This is not at all the way that Boulder should be behaving. We understand that filling in the floodplain is not appropriate. There was a very extensive study done by Gilbert White and a team of experts in 2001. Uh, and they urged the city not to build in this floodplain and they urge the city to consider a wide variety of measures, which frankly, it has not. So please, tonight, I ask you, do not move forward with this disposal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Okay, Rosemary, you can unmute yourself now. And up next will be Brian Buma. Hi, my name is Rosemary Hegarty. Thanks so much for listening to all of us tonight. Um, I don't have a lot okay. to add to the group to what's been said. I really agree with everything that's already been mentioned. You know, I feel like this land was purchased by the citizens of Boulder and that should be respected. I feel like the charter does not agree with moving forward th with the disposal of this land. There are endangered species on the land that should be protected. I'm also really concerned about what that um, flood mitigation will do to all the open space and wetlands in that area and how it will affect the groundwater. Um, and so I really just hope you um, just flat out don't vote for this and say, no, you will not dispose of this land. Um, it's, it's a really, not a good project. I don't think it should move forward. I don't think there's enough um, information on how that flood plane or or that dam is even going to affect things. Um, where you know, I've heard that you know there's concern that it will help Fraser Meadows, but it may but it may make flood issues worse for other neighborhoods. And I don't think that that's been looked at enough. So I'm really concerned about this whole project and I just think the city needs to slow down. You know, I think that CU is holding us hostage um, to try to get this floodplain, you know, mission done. And so they're trying, they're, you know, they're trying to buy their annexation by, you know, holding out this carrot that will give you this land if you let us do what we want on this land. And I just, I don't, I don't respect that at all. So I think we just need to say no. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brian, you can unmute yourself and on deck is Michael Browning. Brian, go ahead. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so first off, uh, thanks for playing the leadership role in our city. I do appreciate all the board takes on. It's, it's a ton of work and I thank you for it. So I'd urge the board not to dispose of this land um, either, which is clearly against the charter and it'll degrade the open space land far beyond that which is traded, you know, traded away. In reading the open space charter, section 176, open space is only for specific purposes and others have said several things. Um, but first one, paragraph A, identifying principle key to our lovely open space, like our city's open space, is the preservation of natural areas characterized or including terrain, flora, fauna, they're unusual, spectacular, scientifically valuable, and rare examples of native species. And this area, it fits the description perfectly. It's one of the reasons why Boulder's so wonderful. 
And so it's directly against the charter, both in its literal text and the spirit of the program too, to consider chipping away at that which makes Boulder what it is. Um, you know, the area is home to several rare, rare species like the Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse, the Ute Orchids and countless native ones. And the loss may not doom them, but it's just one more thing. And further, it, the construction this enables will dramatically reduce the value of the surrounding open space from an ecological point of view, including that traded land. Uh, you know, we can't pretend these decisions happen in a vacuum. Uh, this does not benefit the community of people, nor plants, nor animals. <laughs> in ecology, we call it a ratchet of events. Every little thing, you know, small in itself, chips away at the whole and it can't be reversed. So over time, it just slowly degrades things and it can't be pulled back. And this is very much one of those things. Dams are incredibly ecologically powerful. So I urge you to reject this proposal and not dispose of the land. I really feel the Open Space Board would be going contrary to its core duty, purpose, and against that which makes Boulder and its open space unique by disposing of this land, despite the clear wording of um, 176 A, E, G, A, B, C, <laughs> and the whole spirit of the thing. So thank you for your time. Thank you for holding this uh, meeting. And uh, yeah, just thanks. Thank you, bye. Okay, Michael, you can unmute yourself and on deck is Jan Trussell. Good evening. Uh, this is Michael Browning. I've lived and been a lawyer in Boulder for nearly 40 years. I recognize that the board is sort of between a rock and a hard place on this issue. On the one hand, the city seems uh, bent to uh, hell and high water to proceed with this flood project, no pun intended. On the other hand, this land is critical and has critical and very high environmental values. So I think you need to proceed cautiously. Um, I think it's fine in the resolution to itemize sort of the, the terms, conditions that are necessary that if a disposal is required to give the city notice, advance notice of what, what they're gonna be up against and what needs to be negotiated uh, as part of the annexation agreement and otherwise. But those terms, conditions are based on what is known now. This project's not gonna be built for many years and there's lots of more information that's gonna come out in the future, including the terms of the annexation agreement the preliminary design of the flood wall, uh, the groundwater study that was mentioned, and there's not even been any input yet from Fish and Wildlife or Army Corps of Engineers. So I think it's way premature to be considering a final disposal, even if you list the terms and conditions, because those terms and conditions may well change in the future. Um, I think the mechanism that in this resolution needs to be change substantially. It shouldn't say as it does now, hereby approving disposition. It should say that you'll consider disposition in good faith once those term conditions and the MOU is in writing. And we're a lot farther down the road about what the actual impacts of this project and what terms and conditions and in terms of environmental condition, environmental mitigation are needed. So in short, it's way too soon to adopt the language in the current resolution of hereby approve it should be, we'll consider in the future. And here are some minimum things we know now that need to be done. So in closing, I think it'd be irresponsible for the board to take action on a final disposition, even subject to current terms and conditions at this point. Thank you much. Thank you for the close reading on that, Mike. Okay, Jan, you can unmute yourself now and on deck is Joy Road. Hey, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. yes. Yes, my name is Jan Trussell. I'm uh, speaking on section 176, uh, particularly paragraph E and G. Uh, many of us are aware this property is one of the finest riparian areas along the Front Range. This particular land is home to two endangered species, the Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse and the Ute Ladies Tresses Orchids. We as taxpayers here in Boulder time and time again have voted overwhelmingly to tax ourselves to purchase, maintain and preserve open space lands for decades. Open space land under paragraph E is supposed to limit urban sprawl and discipline growth. Therefore, annexing a massive 308 acre property equal to the size of the main campus and to the city for the purpose of development is the exact opposite of limiting urban sprawl and disciplining growth. And regarding paragraph G, utilization of land to prevent encroachment on floodplains, 
Well, now isn't that exactly what CU South would be doing? Haven't we learned our lessons from years of trial and error with the notorious Hogan Pencost debacle in East Boulder? I spoke at those meetings numerous times against development in those floodplains. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now here in South Boulder, my neighbors and myself are fighting the very same argument again after the 2013 flood wreaked havoc in my Martin Acres neighborhood. Here we are actually talking about building and a floodplain once again. When does this insanity end? I would kindly like to remind our open space board that it would be a dereliction of duty under the charter to dispose of this particular parcel of land for the purpose of development. You would essentially be paving the way for CU South to build, <clears throat> to be built and setting up precedent for future open space land to be disposed of and used for out of control growth and development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Okay, Joy, you can unmute yourself. On deck is Edith Stevens. I don't see Edith's name in the list tonight. Edith, if uh, you are on the phone, can you press star nine to raise your hand so I know that that's you? Otherwise, I won't be able to unmute you later. Okay, go ahead, Joy. Thank you. My name's Joy Rohde, and I want to thank OSMP for really holding true to the mission statement about creating a quality of life here in Boulder, um, contributing to our community. Uh, it certainly has impacted both, um, you know, what I do during the week and, and also my property values. Um, I love the recreational opportunities that the South Boulder property offers to us. I see kids there, people are riding their bikes and they're walking around and they're, um, I mean, certainly, when you go to Marshall Mesa or Dry Creek or, or Dowdy Draw, the South Boulder Trail, the parking lots are overflowing. And, and it's the case at South Boulder uh, as well. I really have concern that, you know, our population has grown and grown. Our growth has been huge. And yet we really, you know, if we're drawing down more open space by building here, it's, it's not going to help. And it's an artificial construct to say that taking a five acres away is just a small piece because ecologists know you can't separate that. The Preble's jumping mouse isn't going to recognize that, oh, you know, it's just a portion of that. When CU South is built, it's going to be traumatic to that property. There's 2,200 new inhabitants there, and it's really an artificial need when you could do a land swap for a North Boulder property. They could easily do that. That's in an urban area. Um, in, in fact, the property should be considered under easement considerations because it's been in public use for more than 18 years. Um, and I worry about this death by a thousand cuts. Somebody else talked about the X goes to zero when you start to just cut away and cut away and cut away. There's enough growth here in this town already that we really can't sacrifice what has made people want to move to this town in the first place. Um, and, I, and I worry about the potential flooding of other neighborhoods. We really haven't done the right assessment there. If we build a flood down there, sure, it might really help Fraser Meadows, but does that mean that the flooding is worse in other South Boulder neighborhoods? I think it's really irresponsible to take a vote until we know exactly what the repercussions are here. So thank you so much. Thank you, Joy. Okay, Edith, if you are on and you're under a nickname or something like that, please, uh, you can message me in the chat. Let me know that you are here, but let's move on if I don't hear from you uh, to Francis Hartog. And uh, on deck will be Jenny Prim. Let me find Francis. Okay, Francis, you can unmute yourself. Good evening, trustees and OSMP staff. Uh, I'm Francis Hartog, uh, resident of Boulder for almost 40 years. And tonight, staff has asked OSBT to accept the subcommittee's version of a resolution approving a conditional disposal of five acres of our unique open space. And this disposal decision will be conditioned on OSMP and Public Works entering into an interdepartmental MOU. I urge the OSBT not to approve the conditional disposal set forth in the subcommittee's resolution. In fact, the trustees have a much better option before them that is more protective of the board's mandate and the integrity of the disposal process. I would say if and only if it is indeed indisputable that construction of the flood wall is the only way to protect downstream residents who are allowed to build in the floodplain, 
The better approach is that of the earlier resolution presented to the trustees in May with a few updates. This resolution communicates to the public and council in detail the conditions that must first be met in order for the trustees to consider a disposal. This is the correct approach. And frankly, as a former trustee, I affirm that it's the board's mandate to make recommendations to council and not so much dictate to staff the contents of an interdepartmental MOU. Uh, the alternative resolution is important because it reflects the years of knowledge built up by open space trustees based on information about the proposed flood mitigation project as that information has become available, thus helping provide new and future trustees with the benefit of, of this background to inform their decision-making. So to conclude, while an interdepartmental MOU is important, and should be pursued by OSMP and Public Works staff. The trustees do need to provide a resolution that sets forth for council for OSMP, Public Works and Boulder residents, the conditions that must be fulfilled before the trustees will approve disposal of these open space acres. Thanks to all of you for your dedicated work on this important issue. Thank you so much. Thank you, Francis. Jenny Prim. You can unmute yourself now and on deck is Richard Harris. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, hello Jenny. Hi, Jenny Prim, I am a South Boulder resident. Uh, I will start by thanking everyone, um, the trustees for having everyone speak tonight and for listening to us and for everyone's comments. I can't really add anything more um, as everyone has really touched on the purpose as laid out by section 176 for what the purpose is of open space. I've been a resident here for eight years and I will say one of the, the biggest draws of Boulder is the open space and the beauty and the connection to the land here. And as a resident of South Boulder, the fact that I can get to this property and enjoy it daily with my children, with my partner, with my dogs is a real blessing and a real draw. And I would strongly encourage and ask trustees to not vote to dispose of this land. It's meaningful. The, be, the ability to have a place to go and recreate or to sit and be with nature or listen to the birds in the springtime or watch the snow fall against the flat irons is a gift, something that we should not take for granted. And to dispose of this one to five acres and not know exactly what that impact would do to not only this direct piece of property, but to neighboring properties and neighborhoods around that area is just too great of a risk. So I implore you to hold your duty as trustees and do what's right and not vote to dispose of it. Thank you. Okay, Richard Harris, you can unmute yourself. And on deck is Max Goldmeisel. I don't see Max here tonight. So Max, if you're here, please message me in the chat so I know what name you're under. Go ahead, Richard. This is Dick Harris. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes. we've got you, Dick. OK. Um, I'm Dick Harris, 2645 Briarwood in the city. Before you, as you've heard from all the other speakers, is a re preposterous proposal. It advocates disposing of open space property for a hypothetical flood mitigation project that has not been formally approved by the University of Colorado or the city of Boulder. Neither has it been approved by all sorts of other agencies without which it cannot be constructed. And recent events strongly suggest that the project will never proceed. Your responsibility, according to the city charter, is to first deal with environmental impacts. Unless you have access to secret information, you don't even know where the project will be located. And you can't possibly know what the environmental consequences therefore may be. So what you're being asked to do, even though we don't know where this perhaps illegal idea originated, 
is number one, open space, as Peter Mayer said, calls for utilization of land to prevent encroachment on floodplains. And the disposal of this land will in fact do the opposite and enable encroachment on the South Boulder Creek floodplain. Secondly, there's an incomprehensible rush to conditionally dispose of open space land without following proper public procedures or notification. You advertise this meeting, for example, using the name Van Vliet. Nobody under 50 years old knows what that means. And thirdly, the Open Space Board of Trustees has a sacred trust to the, from the people. You must do your job and protect Boulder open space, not dispose of it without proper process. What worries me most about this possibly illegal action is that you will damage our citizens' trust, that you will effectively guard their nationally prominent preservation of natural areas. Don't do this. And don't let the University of Colorado insist on ineffective flood mitigation. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. OK, Max, if you are the caller on the phone, please press star 9 to raise your hand so we know that's you, and then we can unmute you. Um, let's move on while we wait for that. Mike Chiropolis. <laughs> Let me find you in this list. You can unmute yourself. And then on deck is Gwen Dooley. OK, ready to go. You can hear me? Yes. Yes, Mike. OK, first, thank you to trustees and staff for their service, their hard work, and their, de and their dedication. I ask you, trustees, to please use the tools at your disposal to protect the agency's mission. As citizens are asking you to do unanimously tonight, namely, don't abandon our environment or ignore our climate resiliency and equity action plans, absent missing analysis. Approving disposal at this time needs to, cannot happen for primary um, sets of missing analysis. The city hasn't looked at a land exchange alternative where we could protect 300 acres designated for protection since the 1970s at no cost to taxpayers because we own 235 acres at the planning reserve. Second, climate equity and resiliency. The city gets an A for the action plans. They get an incomplete or a DNNF for walking the talk on this project, and that is concerning to citizens. Third, the benefits to the greater South Boulder Creek ecosystem under a reclamation and restoration scenario. Fourth, the OSMP um, user update showing an explosion in use as a huge issue. By analogy, if this project were proposed for El Dorado Canyon State Park, 160 acres, conditions would be the equivalent of talking about landscaping and architecture for a project that would compromise the entire park. Colorado Parks and Wildlife would go to the mat to protect its park. Please do the same here. Thanks again for your service. Thank you, Mike. Okay, Gwen. You can unmute yourself, and then it looks like Kathy Joyner um, is raising her hand to, to speak, and that's that's all we have. My unmute, unmuted. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, now you're muted again, Gwen. Let me see if I can't help you unmute. Tried to send you an unmute button there. Yeah. I got muted again. There, there you are. Okay. Start over. Thank you. I served on the Open Space Board of Trustees for eight years, four years as chair, and I'm really concerned about what's happening now because most people do not generally understand what has happened over the decades. To begin with, Flatiron's paving was to restore the land after they finished graveling it. The city of Boulder would then buy it for open space. This understanding transgressed when CU jumped in to buy the land uh, 
asking explicitly that the appraiser appraise it for 16 million when Jim Crane's appraisal had come in at 9 million. And then there was a little funny business there with CU and, and uh, a granting of a $5 million gift to CU from the uh, a short family. Anyway, CU wound up paying 11 million for the property. Now CU is demanding all city departments to give in to them and annex the property immediately. I cannot believe the pressure that is being applied to everyone in the city to do this immediately. Annexation is way premature when the citizens of Boulder will be voting on this acquisition and its annexation agreement on November 9th. Any current council member running for office or anyone planning to will have to be running on this issue because it's so incredibly important to the citizens of Boulder. Right now, this is a functioning ecosystem with wolves on there. Respect that and the citizens weighing in on it November 9th. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Gwen. Okay, it looks like we're done with the list of who signed up in advance and now people can raise their hands if they want to speak. We have Kathy Joyner up and then Lynn Siegel on deck. Karen, if you could add a last name, rename yourself and add a last name, we'll need that before we can unmute you or you can send me a chat and I can rename you. So Kathy, you can unmute yourself now. Kathy, are you? Oh, there yes, you are. I'm here. Okay, I'm here. great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I'd like to express my support for the draft conditional disposal resolution being addressed at tonight's meeting. This document appears to represent an equitable compromise to an earlier version and would ensure that OSMP lands are adequately protected when the less than five acres of open space along the CDOT right of way are needed for the city's very important flood mitigation project. I'm hoping that the board will find a way to ensure that actions tonight do nothing to delay the project further. This is a critical health and safety project overdue for decades, and your help is needed to move this along efficiently, and at the same time, in a manner which reflects your responsibilities to open space. This draft offered by board members Estrella and Halstein appears to do just that. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, Lynn Siegel. And, and Lynn spoke for about a minute um, in the beginning and we made an agreement. So why don't we give Lynn another minute, okay? Okay, I only have a two minute timer, so. Okay. Lynn, will you just do us a favor? We, we, we heard from you for a minute. Uh, give us a minute if you would. Oh, I want my two minutes. Sure. All right, you can have your two minutes. Go ahead. Um, my dad went to see you. My brother went to see you. My son went to see you. Um, I've been here since 1987. I'm from North Boulder, not anywhere near South Boulder. I advise you not to dispose of this property. Um, I want to tag to um, Gwen Dooley's comment about 16 million suddenly magically be became 11 million. See, you can't be trusted. As part of that deal, Dick Tharp got his athletic director position at CU. And he was all on the liquor board. And recently when that land was sold for this uh, huge market rate place, this is the kind of growth that we don't need in Boulder. And this is going to impact on our open space that is not OK. Um, we don't want dams. Fish don't like the dams. Um, I told you that earlier. Um, we don't know yet what CDOT's going to do. Um, I don't know where Gordon McCurry is tonight, but we need him here, too. Um, Gilbert White was brought up numerous times. You can see his statue down by the, um, not his statue, but that that thing down by the um, Arapaho and Broadway. Um, that I really liked Brian's discussion of the ratchetive effect 
Um, oh, Edie Stevens needs to get on. I don't know what happened with her, but try and find her if you can, Allison. And um, what we do need is we need to separate these issues. This is the key. CU and floodplain, totally separate. We already have one annexation we can't ha handle in gun barrel. We don't need any more of this. Thank um, you very much, Lynn. And alternate six. Okay, Allison, does that bring us to the end of the list? So Karen Goblman is last. Yep. Okay, so Karen, great. you can unmute yourself now. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, um, so I'd like to thank you and the trustees for all the hard work that you've done on this issue. And I'd like to ask you to reject the, the disposal of open space land near CU South. According to the Open Space Charter, Section 176, Paragraph H, open space should be the preservation of land for its aesthetic or passive recreational value and its contribution to the quality of life for the community. My family takes a stroll at CU South several times a week. The tranquility of this natural area makes it a bonding experience for our family and our neighbors that we meet there. The disposal of open space land to allow this unique area and its beauty to be taken away from our community is in complete contrast to your charter. My kids learn to mountain bike and cross country ski on its trails and use it regularly to connect to, alter, to, to other trails. Anyone who has seen the ponds at sunset cannot imagine the demise of this area and its inhabitants. I urge you not to take this land from our community. Once it is gone, it is gone forever. You will be remembered for developing this land or protecting it. I urge you to make the right decision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. And um, with that as our final public speaker, I think I can speak for all trustees to say we heard a lot of wonderful information from the public. And particularly, I'd like to thank you all for staying so focused on the topics at hand, um, collected, uh, civil and reasonable. I really appreciate all the information you presented. With that, we did say we were gonna take a five minute break before returning back to the content of the issue. So if that's all right, I'd like to break until 9.01, it appears. 9.01, do I have 8.46 right now? Oh, is it? Sorry. Do you wanna do 15 minutes or do you wanna? No, uh, let's do five. Um, so 51, forgive me. Let's do 52, because it just went to 52. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Okay, I can't tell if I'm seeing all the pictures. I believe we're waiting for Caroline and Dave still. Great. Thanks, Caroline. See you that down there. Yep. We're just waiting for Dave and then we will proceed. Thanks, Dave. I'm here. <laughs> okay, um, well, one thing I am sure Michelle and I uh, would both agree on is that we learned a great deal in the committee process. And the public touched on one point in particular that I know for us to proceed from emails I've seen will have to be discussed and addressed. And that's the concept of the interdepartmental memorandum of understanding. Um, it's my opinion that maybe a good way to kick off our discussion is to ask uh, Janet Roberts to join us and to explain a little bit about the Interdepartmental Memorandum of Understanding, a little bit about the enforceability of such agreements and um, how it is as a committee that we decided um, this concept of shaping or helping shape the IDMOU uh, would, would be important to any disposal that we might contemplate on any condition. Caroline, I see your hand up. Hey, thanks. Um, 
I, if you think it would be all right, I think it would be good for us to, since there are so uh, many members of the public listening, let them know that there was an additional um, document sent out. And maybe as we discuss name, the one that is in the packet versus the other one and kind of lay that framework for them. So um, as we move forward, it's not confusing because obviously none of them know that um, we all received a, a different document um, early this morning. So just so that's like really clear to everyone. Great. Um, we will be uh, sharing a, a se several uh, pieces of revision and feedback provided by uh, Karen and Dave on the packet related memo. And those are gonna be uh, well discussed and heard, but I think it's very important that this committee cover some critical points that in our many hours of work um, began to discuss. So I think we need to begin there. And Janet, if you wouldn't help us sort of begin on, on that piece to just set up how the appearance of the Interdepartmental Memorandum of Agreement um, came into play and why it's believed critical to any contemplated disposal. Yes. Thank you, Hal. I'm Janet Michaels with the City Attorney's Office. An interdepartmental memorandum of understanding is a memorandum that comes from the city manager and it's a directive to the departments. So it would be a directive in this case um, to the Open Space and Mountain Parks Director and we're assuming that there will be a request from the Utilities Department to approve of a disposal for the flood wall. So it would also be directed to the utilities director or to the, uh, or, or the director of, yeah, the director of utilities. Um, it lays out, it, IDMOU for short, lays out um, what the departments agree to. And essentially in this case, so what utilities would have to do to um, access the property, it would have, uh, conditions on insurance for their contractors. It would identify responsibilities for the site. Um, and it can also identify um, different um, insurance, I said insurance requirements, indemnification, um, how they would restore the land um, consistent with whatever conditions are that, that the trustees approve in a disposal. Um, and it's enforceable because it is um, a directive from the city manager. So it's something that the department directors are required to honor um, because it is coming from their, their manager. Um, you know, there, there typically wouldn't be an, any kind of a lawsuit or anything like that. I mean, it's interdepartmental, but it's um, something that they wouldn't go contrary to the the directives of their manager. Um, and Hal, I'm sorry, I lost track of the other things that you wanted to, about the IDMOU and why we think it's important well, at this we, stage. Yeah, I mean, um, um, we agreed that it should be included because we thought it would be a critical piece of document in, in, in any regard to the ultimate management of this land. And, and then additionally, tell me if I'm wrong, we added um, a specific review of the IDMOU, which would come after any action by this board and council, should a, a, a disposal be contemplated or executed, which would then need to comport with the conditions of the document. That's absolutely correct. That's what we added to the resolution. So it would be something that the, the trustees would, it would be a condition of the disposal, those conditions of the IDMOU. Great. So that explains how it made its appearance. And I think it's a good moment to open up for questions from trustees to you that they have about IDMOU. Michelle? Oh. Caroline? Hey, um, sorry to do this again. I just, I really want to make sure that the people that are listening are able um, to be following along. Um, and it seemed like a lot of our listeners thought that um, a disposal decision might be made tonight. So I just want to say for anyone that's listening that um, tonight is not about making a disposal, disposal decision. Um, we have in our packet what the subcommittee created um, 
in order for conditions for disposal. And then as Hal said, Karen and Dave also made a second document um, outlining conditions that would need to be met in order to consider voting on a disposal. I just wanna make that super clear for everyone listening, just so as we move forward, anything that's said doesn't um, get misconstrued or, or anything like that. So um, I just wanted to, to just put that out there again for the public. I, I really appreciate that comment, Caroline, and I think it can be helpful because given um, Dave and Karen's uh, commentary on this document, I think it's fair to say that three trustees don't find the committee's document acceptable. So we can put down for a moment everybody's concern that there's going to be a conditional disposal this evening, which might help us refocus on the work at hand, which is trying to understand this deal better, ask the important questions, and make progress on, on the project at hand. So is, is that does that work? I think three people have been pretty clear about that, and I, I have no problem admitting it. So the current, but in, in order for us to dis discuss the next document from which this is struck in its entirety, it's important for us to first understand why our committee thought it was so critical. Um, so anyway, that, uh, I hope that's helpful. Um, I, I certainly found uh, it convincing that an IDMOU and OSBT's ability to approve it, review it, and subject it to scrutiny was a very important thing at some point for this board. Um, are there other pieces uh, in the, and, and, and I'm gonna try and skip ahead through time so we don't waste much of it. it it's kind of clear through um, suggested changes that many of what the changes that we did here are actually quite acceptable to uh, all trustees, or at least the majority, including changing the language that specified five acres or less, um, a lot of specific uh, wording changes, um, some addition that we did uh, as a committee that was well thought on item five related to the flood wall. The previous version of this document, which we began with, included no provisions related to the flood wall. So we did some really good um, important thinking there about uh, specific criteria that we had discussed as a board in many prior meetings, but which had not yet made it into any resolution document, hence the addition. Um, do people have questions or concerns about the addition of the section related to flood wall? or have different recollections about our prior uh, uh, sort of discussions about what we wanna see in terms of limitations on that. Dave? Yeah, you know, I think uh, you will see and know that um, in the uh, revision of the revision that Karen and I uh, proposed, uh, we don't. Uh, we, we've made some, you know, some editorial uh, suggestions or um, changes, but as far as the overall thrust of, of number five, we, we don't. And just let me say, even on the notion of an MOU, um, we included that in, in our uh, revision as well, because if, if staff thinks that's the the a proper and appropriate vehicle to accomplish, um, you know, meeting the conditions and uh, being able to uh, consider a decision, then, um, you know, I, I think as far as we are concerned, uh, that's fine. And I think Janet uh, has provided some assurance. My, my personal concern was that an MOU could be voided by future city managers or or councils, and if if that is not the case, or if that is extremely difficult to do, then um, you know I'm I'm kind of less concerned with using that as a vehicle. I I don't know whether that's the most appropriate one, but if staff thinks that, then um, I don't think we have uh, substantive objections to that. Um, that that's great, and that's helpful. One thing that I think the committee did, which um, 
uh, I was actually quite surprised to see you, you didn't necessarily want included in the mechanism area was rights of uh, reversion that were all individual and several related to all conditions. And we actually left that discussion off if there could be any ways that the IDMOU could be included as, as a possible condition like that to help um, flesh that exact problem out, which still does seem like a bit of a gray area. Yeah, we, oh. <laughs> Uh, please, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, uh, we did address that. Um, I think in in our uh, version that we, we had trouble with the word re reversion, um, and I think there was uh, some concern that once a disposal decision is made, uh, it actually can't be reverted or um, you know changed, and so I think there certainly is some. Uh, you know, concern over whether that, in fact, legally can happen. And so um, we tried to uh, make the, uh, the language s simple in saying that, you know, if conditions aren't met, then the land, the land is still retained by the city and uh, cannot be conveyed to any third party. That's great. Um, I'd like to ask if uh, maybe um, if all trustees want to come off of mute if they're comfortable. I'm okay with this discussion, us moving past the formality of raised hands. I really trust everybody's respectfulness, and I just think it'll help us keep the pace high because we do have other important business ahead of us still this evening in matters from the department. Good idea. Thanks, Hal. Great. Um, one other thing I'd like to highlight about the committee's work is that we did quite a bit of background research, um, thought about uh, funding and escrow in many different ways, and ultimately did land on a conclusion that this could be possible within the interdepartmental context and everything. And so we saw that as a very worthwhile use of our time. Um, oh, can, I, can I chime in just a second here? Yes. Um, since we're all off mute. Um, I heard the, the public input and it was very enlightening to me. I, I try to keep tally, but I, I caught 22 people who were, were not in support of, um, of disposal. And, and, and I don't know if my tally is right, um, but I heard some people say that they were not as supportive of disposal now. And I heard some people say that they're, that they're never going to be in support of disposal. And I think that that was enlightening for me. I, I am curious how many of my fellow trustees feel that way in going through this process of iterating on additional resolutions. Because if that's the case, if that is if that's how a majority of the the, the trustees feel, I I feel like just a, a little like my hands are tied. Just 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 putting that out there. Um, I just also wanted to just interject here that sort of the reasons why we came up with the, the IDMOU and the idea of um, a conditional disposal is because a lot of the resolutions that we've passed um, in the past are non-binding. And maybe this is all super basic for, for you all, um, but that's something that I learned in this process is we can write all kinds of resolutions. And, um, but they're not binding. They, they can send a message, they can send mixed messages, we, and then they can, a, a different um, body down the road can feel differently and, and not honor past resolutions. Um, you know, coming into this board and three meetings in, and I realized that I'm in a, a minority, I think, here, and um, there is a majority of people who feel a certain way about this particular project. And really, I, I would think, just to be super pragmatic, that this would be a great opportunity for the, the majority of this board to set down some conditions and it, that are actually binding. And to me, this wasn't about like shoving down a disposal. It was like, well, if we have this list of uh, conditions, I imagine that you would want to memorialize them um, you know, and, and, um, and make them stick. So that's the place that I was coming from, not like, hey, we're gonna dispose of this. More like if we were to dispose this, of this, this is a perfect opportunity to actually make 
um, your, your wishes binding. And in the form of an IDMOU that, that takes place after having um, talked at length with Janet about this is the way is the mechanism and to do that to, to do that to memorialize that to and we get that additional check in to say okay we, um, yes this is a uh, if all these conditions are met disposal can happen but by the way we want to make sure that they're met in this this MOU. And so that's, I just wanted to provide that level of background as we dive into the details that this is the opportunity to provide a binding agreement in, in, um, in the potential disposal of this property. Not that we're saying that it's happening, but that's, you know, that's where that comes from. One of the things I've struggled with personally, Michelle, I think, as you know, is that in my own private life, um, when trying to create conditions around something and negotiating, I've always felt it's very important to my ethics to be as forthright and clear as possible about my expectations and, and not to be too convoluted. Um, and that was uh, something I felt that we were making some progress on. Not that I had expectations that this board would necessarily want to do a conditional disposal at this time, but that we had provided additional clarity that if anything would uh, give the negotiators on the part of the city the confidence to really try and achieve what they were hoping to achieve vis-a-vis -vis Colorado University um, within the context as it exists presently in city council, in that discussion and in the term sheet. And so um, that, was, that was a big driver for me. So for me, what I heard from the public really wasn't um, that they would never approve the disposal. I heard um, their view on their interpretation of our charter. Um, almost everyone referenced the charter um, and felt that it was important to uphold what had been paid for by the citizens. So I, I don't, I, I disagree with you because I, I don't feel like I necessarily heard a lot of people say they would never um, support a disposal more so of what they felt that the open space board of trustees um, being in alignment with the charter was there to do as far as terms and agreements that can shift down the road for a project like this unfortunately being open to shift i think is important because you know for worst case example if there is a flood in a year or two years that is the same size as the one that happened prior, what is written will more than likely be moot and it will need to have changes because of the environmental impacts of what nature is providing for us. Um, so saying that we're going to have something that will stick, I don't, I, depending on how long this project takes and what mother nature decides to do, um, it, it doesn't seem to be realistic. It, it seems that there are terms and conditions that as time goes by are, are going to be subject to change simply by, by way of life. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that's all valid. I, I also think that um, through many, many board meetings that I've sat in and with multiple boards now, we've been working towards a list of conditions that I believed people felt would ultimately create net benefit to the department, the open space department, and would be adequate compensation, even given, even given the threatened species, et cetera. In this case, uh, 119 to one, two, three, four, or five acreage trade, um, plus water rights, all the other essential, th everything our brain power has gone into thinking would be required to create net benefit for the department. And not only that, but to deliver permanently preserved land to the residents of Boulder, which presently there is none of. That is private property owned by CU. Um, and so I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, other, do, do you wanna, Michelle, just point out, go ahead, Karen. I, I want to go back to something um, that both you and Michelle said earlier. Um, I want to thank you 
for your work and as you put it, the clarity that, that you've provided. And I think there are several sections which in the um, revised resolution that Dave and I worked on, we retained because of that clarity and because of the value we think they add to the resolution, things like the flood wall, the definition of the replacement property, um, the community benefits provisions. So I, I wanna again, thank you and Michelle for the work you did. Um, the reason why for me, the MOU doesn't make as much sense as it seems to to you is because I see the MOU as an agreement among staff members to help move forward their work. And, and when I read the charter, um, the responsibilities of the Open Space Board of Trustees do not include giving staff direction on how to do their work. Um, and, and so I just felt that, that that was outside of the board's responsibilities. Um, for that reason, in the draft that Dave and I worked on, we said that we're fine with the city open space and mountain parks department and the public works department creating an MOU and working through an MOU um, for the reasons that you wanted them to, to construct an MOU. But for us, that was not a driving mechanism for the resolution. I think, Karen, can I jump in? I think that's an extremely important point we need to dig into because that, that wasn't Michelle and Mai's individual creation. It was staff it's, itself's acknowledgement that that document was gonna be critical to us getting what we wanted through the resolution. I understand that. So I, I'd love to hear from that, Janet about th that. If view. I could finish, if I could finish my yep. thought first, mm -hmm. please. Yep. For, for me, the critical documents for OSBT are um, the provisions in the resolution and itemizing what would need to be done by city, by the city, the city staff, before coming back to the board with a request for disposal. And that's why the wording that we have used in our version of the resolution says, OSBT is hereby specifying the terms and conditions that will need to be satisfied before any of the flood wall acres will be disposed of in order to give the city time to satisfy such conditions before any formal disposal request will be considered by the Open Space Board of Trustees. It is hereby resolved that OSBT will not officially, finally, or formally approve the disposal of any of the flood wall acres for construction of the flood wall unless and until all the following conditions have been first fulfilled or addressed to the satisfaction of OSBT. The other reason for me why that's important is that any one open space board of trustees cannot bind future boards for an action that has not, that is not ready to take place. And I agree with several of the people who spoke during public testimony in terms of the things that are missing. And that's why in our version of the resolution, we added things like section 7.9 that speaks to the environmental impacts that have to be addressed in terms of groundwater analysis and uh, groundwater conveyance system and environmental impact statement and site specific biological right. assessment for uh, the project. But before we begin reading the revision and, and uh, rest assured, I think we should put it on the screen and the public should see the language mm -hmm. and we need to look at it. I would like to address some of these core questions where they, they will see if we show them immediately, you struck pretty much all reference to the IDMOU, which really is differential from what we heard from staff that would be constructive and helpful for them. So basically the public and certain members of the board and staff, there isn't clarity about whether 
that that is appropriate, inappropriate. So I think it'd be helpful to deal with that before we daylight the issue of the mechanism, if that's okay. Does that work for you? Okay. Um, so I'd like to return to Janet and say, we've heard members from the public, public say it's outside of our purview to be making any specific conditions related to ID, IDMOU. And yet we also are hearing staff say it's very important that this is uh, addressed because it will be the functional document. Thank you, Hal. Um, I would like to add something to what I had said before about the IDMOU. It's, when you look at Charter Section 177, it says that no open space land may be sold, leased, traded, or otherwise conveyed unless it's disposed of um, by the board and by city council. When you have an interdepartmental transfer of management, if you will, that doesn't fit into Charter Section 177. So the IDMOU was also a way to have in effect a document of conveyance. It's, it, it's kind of a, it's a way to convey the, the management responsibilities from one department to, to another. The IDMOU, um, the idea is there are conditions that would be in the IDMOU that are a part of the resolution and have to be included. The resolution identifies conditions that have to be in the IDMOU so that staff fulfills the intention and, and the approval of the board in the disposal per the resolution. Dave or Karen, questions about that? Thoughts? Well, um, again, again, Hal, I think that we're not, I mean, we're, we're not, you know, wildly enthusiastic about the MOU being the vehicle um, for conveyance. But on the other hand, if staff thinks that's the most effective uh, mechanism to achieve uh, the terms and conditions, then then that's okay. I think, you know, the concern that we had is that the annexation process is proceeding. And it's by virtue of circumstance that we are in this position of trying to work with a third party to affect, um, you know, what a second party wants to do. And, you know, otherwise uh, CU would be a non-factor. Uh, we wouldn't care what CU did, but the fact of the matter is, is that they are a player and, and since the annexation agreement seems to be the vehicle for city decisions on the flood mitigation project, then we are by necessity required to participate at the level that meets what we consider to be the open space programs needs. And so um, I think the terms and conditions, uh, we want to make sure the Public Works Department or the city negotiators are well aware of what uh, the board thinks it needs in order to consider making a decision. And, and again, I'm going to reemphasize saying that we, we will make a conditional decision I don't think is supported. We, we want to be assured that our conditions and terms are met before uh, there's a consideration of a decision for disposal. And so I would- the MOU, is a, the MOU is, I think we ought to move on. The MOU is, it's like, okay, well, if that's what the staff needs, then, then that's fine. Okay, I, so, so I mean, forgive me, Dave, it just appeared to me advantageous that at, if there was a disposal that was uh, approved by OSBT, and then presuming it was approved by city council, that the, uh, the, the, there isn't even authorization to create an IDMOU, but then the IDMOU is created after those approvals and votes are received, and that an ability for us to get a final look at that IDMOU, a future board, this board, whichever board it might be, would actually be an added layer of assurance to the public. Um, and that's why I'm so confused by this because 
um, I, 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 I just don't fully get it, but um, shows we have more to think about. Well, based on my opinion is that based on what Janet has said and others have said, um, the, the driver be behind specifying the details about an IDMOU in a version of this resolution is so that uh, is because it affects conveyance. And what my opinion is that we're not ready to, con to affect conveyance. And that's why I prefer setting aside that issue for now and addressing, as Dave said, the current issue, which is itemizing the things that, that the city and CU and the public uh, need to be aware of from the perspective of the Open Space Board of Trustees need to be addressed now before an annexation agreement is concluded by planning board, city council and others who are reviewing the annexation agreement. So, so if and I heard you- That's I heard, the, in my opinion, that's the audience for this resolution. If I heard you correctly, then you believe at some point later in time with perhaps another resolution that we would gain the ability at that time to, to uh, review the idea of you? If at that point in time, whether it's five months from now or a year or two from now, if at that point in time, staff has uh, nailed down all these conditions in the seven, eight pages that we currently have. Um, and the decision is that the next step that's needed is an IDMOU, then that could be crafted at that point in time. But, but I'm not ready to vote on a preliminary, on a conditional disposal at this point. I think that is a, a an, an unnecessary step at this point. Okay. Um, I think, uh, you know, it, it, uh, Janet, please. Yeah, thank you, Hal. I, I do want to respond to something um, that Karen said. It sounds to me, and what I'm afraid the board is getting close to, is attempting to direct the conditions of an annexation. And that is... Okay, then I, I may have heard it wrong. Um, no, that's the responsibility of planning board and council. Exactly. Yeah, that's um, not our purview at all. All right, thank you. That's, that, that was the point that I was going to make. And I, I heard that what I thought I heard was to say, in effect, if certain conditions aren't met, that um, we won't dispose. And these are conditions that have to be a part of the annexation agreement. And in that manner, it would be the board trying to direct what the annexation agreement would include. And that's, that's a legislative action. Um, so it is outside the board's purview. Thank you. I, I feel like as much as we, we don't want to direct annexation, um, it's the same thing with also um, not wanting to direct the, the different departments within who is involved with CU South, with um, Dan Utilities and, and, all, and all of them, um, which is you know what we've been talking about. Um, okay. I, uh, you know, I fail to see how we'll be able to address what I consider to be a, a critical piece of uh, what this will actually in practice do. Um, but I will rest my case there um, that I think that that governing document will someday come back and be of higher importance or more interest to people. Um, so uh, I think maybe Given where we're at for the sake of time, this would be a good time for uh, either Dave or Karen to daylight the revisions that they see uh, to this document. And I think we've talked through some of the marginal ones and we can really focus in, I think, on, on what people would like to discuss. Dave, do you wanna tee that up? Do we? 
Well, I think uh, I'm happy to have Karen uh, start out. I do think that, um, you know, one of the key things for us is to um, note as we have several times that a conditional disposal is not what we consider to be appropriate at this time. So that that action is premature. And um, I think the, uh, the revision language that we have in this document, um, you know, demonstrates that. And, and uh, I, I think, well, I look forward to discussing it. And um, I look forward to making a short brief case about why I think it will be largely disregarded by all the important people in this deal. Um, so we'll, we'll talk that through. Right. Sounds good. Uh, Karen, do you want to? Why know, don't you, Why don't you have Leah put up the the document, and then we can uh, scroll through and highlight sections that are changed? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, in the whereas sections at the beginning, um, or as uh, Hal said, the recitals at the beginning of the document, um, there are a few uh, revisions in the language that um, are relatively minor. And I'm just going to mention those as we scroll through. The first one is. Uh, can you make it a little bit larger, Leah, or not? I'm... Great, thank you. Um, the first one, as you can see with the, the red line track changes, is just to, to note that the city is engaged in negotiations with CU regarding the annexation. Um, that's just a, another statement of fact. Uh, in the next paragraph, um, we felt it was important to note that, that um, at this point, the uh, flood wall is considered to be the only feasible option to prevent overtopping of Highway 36. We, we, we took some issue with that. It's, it's the only feasible cost effective option or one that doesn't involve significant additional damage to open space, but to say it's the only feasible one strikes me as not factually correct, but yep. Um, uh, two sections down from that, um, at the bottom of the page, perfect, Leah. Um, instead of uh, anticipates that the, the public work department desires that to have OSBT approve a disposal. Uh, we just thought it was more straightforward forward to say, we'll ask OSBT to approve a disposal. Um, and then at the end of that particular clause, we thought it was important to not only point it out that uh, the Public Works Department would be constructing, operating, and maintaining the flood wall, but also the groundwater conveyance system. And the next one is, is merely an editorial change to put one phrase in front of another which I'm sure there could be a discussion over. Um, can, uh, can, can I ask you to hold on one second, Karen? Um, sure. Does anyone know how when you put the share screen down, you get it back again? I really need to follow this closely. If you put it down, you get it back? It, it, it like went minimized and now it's gone and I need to follow this presently. Does anybody have any idea about that? I have no idea what you're talking about, so I can't yeah, answer the question. Took it off I, right. Yeah, Hal, is it just, are you seeing just like a little picture of you? I'm seeing the speaker view. I had you large before, front and center, 
and then I tried to look at people again and now I've lost it. Um, let me see. Then in, in the in the little view thing in the upper right hand corner. I've only I have, got gallery and oh if I go to speak. Yeah, speak I have here. mine set on standard. Okay, Here, let me, I'm going, I'll bring that right back up, but. Um, yeah, maybe you can just pop it up again and I'll just yeah. not. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great. Did that, Great. Oh, that worked? I'm back, yep. Oh, okay. Good, <laughs> okay. Um, then the next, uh, whereas, uh, we, we did two things. Um, instead of saying there is no existing contiguous high quality wetlands, um, at the time of the uh, work on the granite property, open space staff did a search for high quality wetlands, not just contiguous, but throughout the area and found no existing high quality wetlands, even though they searched beyond contiguous properties. So we felt it was important to, get, to delete the word contiguous because it was too limiting and not correct. Can I ask John, will you comment on that um, so other trustees can know if that's the case? Um, yeah, I'm not sure that's, that's the case right now, Karen. I um, we we'd have to uh, look into that past work you referred to and and see whether is Don still on the call? Yes, I am. Um, there are no existing high quality wetlands in the vicinity that could be acquired. So I think the, yeah, I, uh, that is gen generally true based on our past evaluation up and down the floodplain. Um, but I, <laughs> I would imagine, Don, it's how you define, it, define it, vicinity. Exactly. I mean, near in the near vicinity might be you could then definitively say that's probably correct, but if someone defines definitively vicinity as the front range or the county or the whole uh, South Boulder Creek. Yep. Well, you could delete uh, in the vicinity of the project and just put oh, in, in the vicinity of Boulder Creek drainage. I, I'm not sure how relevant this is for the meat of the conversation. It, I don't think it's worth our. Okay, great. I just I just remember this was something the committee discussed and wanted to be really clear that we had our facts right. No, appreciate that. Um, the reason we decided to add the next sentence is because we felt it was important to state the fact that. Uh, successful mitigation because, because the fact that there were no existing high quality wetlands that could be acquired, that, that we needed to state successful mitigation of wetland losses require creating new replacement wetland habitat in the project area or in the South Boulder Creek drainage. Okay. And in the next one, uh, I'll say I'll mention Caroline too. Any thoughts you have along the way are going to be really important and helpful. Thank you. Just to finish the recitals, um, the reason why drains were was deleted is that a, a hydrologist told that, us that that was inaccurate. So that's. I don't know if you want to have any further discussion of the recitals or. I, uh, to my, uh, Michelle, what, what is your thought? I'm not seeing anything that feels uh, too material to me. Same here. 
Uh, in my opinion, the next section that I'm going to turn over to to Dave is is the the real critical yeah. part of this document in terms of differences with the document that the committee produced. Um, Dave, I'm delighted to have you lead it. I just wonder personally, are we better to cover the conditions and come back here or we do this now? What are your thoughts? Uh, I would say it's the pleasure of the board. I, I just think the conditions are easy and we can keep going on things that'll be somewhat easier and then we can really come back to this. I think that's fine. Great. Okay, go for it, Dave. Funding. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Leah, Leah, I'm depending upon you to keep, keep scrolling. <clears throat> Perfect. So, yeah, thanks. So the first uh, condition we, we already basically talked about, um, we thought that the language and uh, your guys, uh, the subcommittee's work was fine for all of the next three, except we thought that there were um, other examples uh, of funding issues that needed to be addressed. And so that's why we added uh, a couple more to the ones that you already had. <laughs> So regu regulatory consultation permitting and compliance would also need to be a funding consideration and then uh, contracts for whatever restoration and monitoring work uh, that would be required. Okay. So there were, and there may be more, this I don't think was intended to be all inclusive, but we thought that the, these other last two were important enough to uh, include. So Leah, if you keep going, uh, <clears throat> so the flood wall number five, uh, we basically talked about, um, <clears throat> we thought uh, that the flood wall uh, issue should be connected to, you know, the project de design and, you know, the 30% uh, project design standard that we've heard a lot about and, from our perspective is like we we didn't identify 30 percent specifically but um you know at some point the project design uh is going to drive the permitting process and so um we felt that you know you didn't need to specify a specific time frame for it that uh the permitting process would determine that and um these uh next five uh, items were would be part of um, you know that design and permitting process. And I'll just add that for each of them, impacts and association mitigation mitigation that's required needs to be specified. Right. Right. Which yeah. So, oh, yeah, I, I, and I, I think I understand, but I find this really, uh, I, I can't think anything other than we're giving up an opportunity to include something that this board has talked at, at significant length. I'm, I'm sorry, how, um, what part are you talking about including? I just want to make sure I'm following. Um, for example, uh, taking out the desire to minimize the flood wall to the maximum extent possible, just as example 5.1. Mm -hmm. um, th that is something this board has talked about uh, numerous times, which sort of gives it the credit of the criteria that the other ones have. And I'm just a little confused about why that comes out. But um, And do you mean by that, like the, the different types of flood wall that could be built? We're not talking about, like, obviously, not 500 versus 100. Uh, yeah, no, we're talking about just the, the footprint being designed to the absolute minimum, the length of it being as far away from South Boulder Creek as possible. I just, if the language doesn't go here, I, I, I'm curious where it goes. And then either Karen or Dave, can can you say why you you were okay with not having that in, in there? I just want to make sure I'm following that um, 
5.1 portion correctly. Yeah, we felt that uh, the, the permitting process will basically dictate those. And because that- the, um, the, the regulation agencies will right, right. do that anyways. Okay. Right. And so that it wasn't necessary to specifically call those out uh, just like, you know, we didn't specifically say 30% design phase or something. It's, it's basically the, the permitting is the permits will dictate uh, those project components. Does hearing that make you more comfortable, Hal, or you still don't agree with that? Um, I, I still don't agree. And I just don't think it aligns with the spirit of everything else we've done on the document and I'm mystified, but I feel like Army Corps and, and Fish and Wildlife and, and the permits that they're required to give in, in their outlines. Um, but let me give one example. Let's say the Army Corps says this and this is appropriate, and yet there was an alternative design that would further minimize it. We just gave up our opportunity right. to weigh in. I see John waving. Yeah, no, I think you got it, Hal. Um, it's a, Dave, Dave has a very high opinion of the permitting. Um, I'm not so sure. Well, John, I don't have such a high opinion of permitting, but I will say that um, the permit process, uh, you know, is such that those kinds of issues are addressed. And w whether the outcome is, is something that we, we uh, desire or not um, remains to be seen, but the outcome is gonna be the outcome. So for us to say, well, we ought to minimize, um, you know, the fact is the, the core will decide, you know, what it thinks is appropriate. And if we think something is appropriate, then that's gonna be more of the permitting conversation with them. But they, we, they we, won't be in, we won't be in conversation with them, Dave, it'll be the project. Well, yeah, I, I meant the city. <laughs> yeah. so, so we'll leave it here just because it doesn't seem you have anything to lose on this language. Um, and and uh, staff, myself, and other people think we have a lot to gain as far as protection. If you'd consider budging, that would be really appreciated. Uh, we we so, can budge. But who... Um the the design phase when the when the project is being presented to um the the army corps we come up with with a design and present it to to them is that correct and then they basically say yes that design works or no it doesn't so would we in doing that have an alternative or or um the way that this would work is one design would be picked everything would go into that or would we say if they don't like this one, we we have something else, or is it not work that way? John, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this language is more directed from the OSBT perspective to the utilities department who's working in concert with the design firm and making micro decisions every day about what the design is going to look like. And during that process of designing this stuff, uh, we're making, whether it's a recommendation or a requirement, depending on how this is all worded in the end, we're, we're, we're basically setting out conditions for them to follow as they're making micro decisions in the actual design of the system. That eventually, once the full design is completed, they'll go out to permitting. But I think what the spirit of this is, is to, before we even go to permitting, as you're doing the micro decisions on each design area of the project is to uh, take these things into consideration. Well, if that's the use of this, um, I have no problem in 5.1 saying a minimal footprint for the flood wall uh, for 5.2, the most limited construction impact footprint for the project, uh, for 5.3, a termination of the eastern end of the flood wall that is as far away from South Boulder Creek as possible. Um, and for 5.4, the determination of a minimum 
of acreage of OSMP land needed for maintaining the flood wall and the groundwater conveyance system. Uh, and for 5.5, a groundwater system through the flood wall that maintains existing groundwater conditions on the site. Um, and you have a you have a problem for 5.6 because you feel like it's irrelevant related to other changes elsewhere in the document, even though we feel this is a critical point. Yeah, the people that we talked to um, said that that's not really relevant at this point in the in the decision making and process. Right. So, so I guess this this will be in your next resolution about the IDMOU. Probably, yeah. <laughs> if we're all still alive by then. Yeah. This this is not uh, part of the the as built uh, flood wall or as built uh, structure is not part of the permitting process. And I don't know if Don still Don D'Amico is still on, but Don, if you are, you, you've been through the permitting process. Um, your opinion of what's necessary might be helpful. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> that's, a, that's a tough one, Dave. I, um, there's a lot of moving parts, as you know, and, and, and stuff like this. I, I think what Dan um, lined out seem, is really what the, the process looks like. It's, it's somewhat iterative, but it's also, um, you know, you go to the regulators with your plan. They don't, you don't say, what do you, what do you think we should do? You, you basically um, lay down a, an alternative, your, your preferred alternative, and they, um, tell you where that's permittable or not. So. Don, I, I think that's such a helpful comment. That's exactly what the flood wall is about. The utilities department could come up with something that passed permitting that was not minimized. Correct. So what's the difference between um, 5.1 and 5.2? and what 5.6 means? In, in my opinion, it's a very specific difference because it minimizes the disposal size to the absolute minimum possible. Can you describe to me what 5.6 means without using the words that are there on the paper? It means that the dis disposal would apply literally to the size of the footing on the ground of the wall only. Not five acres. It will be probably less than an acre, ultimately. Is that what we need to be looking at um, in in regards to um, voting on a disposal? Well, typically, um, the the way the board has done these in the past. So, for, for example, like on the Confluence Trail area. Um, it was up to a certain acreage and then the design proceeds and the permitting happens and there's an IDMOU and then the, the project gets built and then the final disposal is just the footprint of the concrete path for that project. But if, the, if a um, disposal request was made down the line when none of us were board members, wouldn't that kind of um, do that for the next board? No, no, um, not necessarily. I mean, it it would all if you if you chart that if you do do a conditional disposal here, yes, that way it would chart all, all that out how they, it would happen. If if you don't, if you choose not to. Um, then we're really obligated to consider any request that comes forward bef uh, before the board um, for a disposal. So if there was another disposal that came along, like Karen said, in five months, in a year, and whatever, um, you know, we're kind of obligated under the charter to consider that. You that board at that time could pull up this motion and say, "Oh, gee whiz, um, maybe we shouldn't 
we, we're going to vote no on this disposal because certain things didn't happen, but you still would have to consider it. Do you, um, Karen, do you, or can you explain to, to me better? I just, I feel like with 5.6, it has the ability to take away um, a vote that might not be ours. Do you, do you see it that way or am I misunderstanding that? I just don't understand what 5.6 means. And, and someone that we consulted with um, said that it was premature. So the combination of not understanding what it means and, and somebody far wiser than I saying it was premature led to its being crossed out. If somebody can, can convince yeah. me that uh, there's word and it's understandable and that it means something. Uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll mention that somebody else said something is not a meritorious argument that wins my commitment. Well, what does it mean? If somebody okay, can if, explain if, in if I, English if, what it means and it makes sense, let's put John, it back in. But what John it what Janet, says is not understandable to me. Okay. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jan, John and Janet, but basically this, the spirit of a lot of this document is that there there's, could be up to five acres that are going to be impacted. Some of those five acres are not ultimately going to be disposed of and no longer under the authority and management of open space. Some of those five acres are going to be uh, allowed for temporary use for access to, to the site or construction type of access use. But after that temporary use is done, those lands still remain with the open space and still are under our management. There'll be a portion of this property, for instance, where the flood wall is, that will be permanently out of open space and thus needs to be disposed of. And that portion of the up to five acres is what will be the actual acreage that will be formally disposed of in perpetuity to it, in this case, into another department for a different use. And is that different than the footprint of the flood wall? It, um, it, it, prob it will primarily be the footprint of the flood wall. So 5.1 and 5.6 are talking about the same thing, question mark? 5.6 gets a little bit more specific about it. Yeah. My only question in reading this again for the group, including my staff and Janet, would be is if, if there needs to be some sort of permanent access uh, rights along the flood wall and open space, whether or not that access route would be continued to be under the auspices of OSMP or not. Um, that would be sort of my only um, question about uh, whether you use the flood wall only as the basis, but. But that doesn't get to the, the intent of 5.6, Dan. And so I think the 5.6 is redundant to 5.1. And if we wanna say minimize, uh, we can certainly say yeah. that. I, I just think that the fact of the matter is, is that that's inherent in all of this, all of these actions is, is that you, you want to minimize the impacts and the costs. And if that's not our intent, then I think uh, we're derelict in our duty. Um, I, I, you know, I understand what you're saying, Karen, if, if it basically in short, to summarize this for everybody, if the mechanism is made meaningless, largely, then it doesn't matter. But if, if the document's actually designed in good faith to do something to meet the department's needs and desires, then it's very important. It's the best summary I can offer on that. I just feel like for us to say a final land transfer now when it could be a different board um, makes me uncomfortable. All right. Well, um, you know what? I um, Given where all this is headed, uh, why don't we continue to move through? Let's celebrate a few things that made sense, like the clarification on the actual parcel itself. 
that the committee was able to conduct from the errors that it originally came with, or basically incomprehensibility that it originally came with. I'm wondering, no. if, I'm wondering if for 5.6, based on what Dan said, uh, 5.6 should say minimize the access needed for flood wall maintenance. That's what 5.4 says. You're right. Okay. Hal, um, can yes. I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, uh, given, given that we have another item on the agenda tonight and we're really doing committee work here and yep. whole board, uh, is there a way that the board could consider either um, excusing some of our staff from staying up well late into the night or putting this back to subcommittee? Um, yeah, so, so I, when you say that, are you uh, legitimately saying dropping the management's uh, response for New Zealand mud snails. We could we could put that to the next meeting or or so, some something. Um, yeah, I sure I sure feel awful about that. If, um, I, but I think that's a good point, and I would prefer doing that rather than than leaving this hang again. Dave, we're anticipating, Caroline. We're anticipating the uh, New Zealand mud snail discussion to be uh, roughly an hour. We have about a 15 minute presentation and we're anticipating that based on the subject matter, we would have about 45 minutes of question and answer. Um, and it's uh, what, what we can't do is begin that now and return to this and cause the public to stay up forever. Um, yeah, I mean, you said that there were two things that we could do. You said that you could put it back to the committee or we could continue on, but we could also take a vote and decide if we want which document. Okay. Um, I let's 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 take it by this approach if it's okay from everybody. Let's leave off the last of the conditions. And right now in front of the public, I'd like to talk about the uh, the mechanism on this document. Um, it, it's, it's very important, I think, that the public understands what's going on with that. So Dave, do you want to present this mechanism? I uh, am having trouble understanding what you're referring to, Hal. Uh, Leah, go back up to the bottom of, of the second page. And then Dave can see what, right there, all the red stuff, good. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think again, we don't need to belabor the interdepartmental MOU if, if uh, you know, that's what is necessary to uh, have staff perform the work that's necessary. Then I, I guess you know that's fine. I, I think the previous whereas is um, we wanted to uh, ensure that this was not a conditional disposal um, request in that, in fact, uh, certain things needed to happen or occur or be resolved before the, that decision was considered. Okay. Um, so, so maybe it would be, would you like to read it out loud? Should I? I think it's so critical. It needs to be read out loud. I, I will be happy to read it out loud. Please, thank you. Okay, so, so I'll do the first where as and then the therefore and, and the furthermore. Mm -hmm. Okay, whereas the OSBT is hereby specifying the terms and conditions that will need to be satisfi satisfied before any of the flood wall acres will be disposed of in order to give the city time to satisfy such conditions before any formal disposal request will be considered by the OSBT. Therefore, it is hereby resolved that the OSBT will not officially, finally, or formally approve the disposal of any of the flood wall acres for construction of the flood wall unless and until all the following conditions have been first fulfilled or addressed to the satisfaction of the OSBT. And furthermore, to enable the specification of the conditions, timeframes, and deadlines for action and associated deliverables, the City of Boulder Open Space and Mountain Parks Department, OSMP, 
and the City of Boulder Public Works Department, Public Works, may enter into a binding interdepartmental memorandum of understanding, MOU, OSMP and Public Works shall report periodically the completeness of all the conditions in this resolution to OSBT and Council to inform the consideration of a disposal decision pursuant to Article 12, Section 177 of the City of Boulder Charter and to thereby enable the installation, operation, and maintenance of a flood wall and groundwater conveyance system as part of the City Council approved South Boulder Creek flood mitigation project, the project. Thank you. Um, so my question in this language, which essentially reads that we will not officially, finally, or formally do anything until the conditions are met, and then additionally reserve the right at that time to figure out what our satisfaction is about those deliverables, pretty much makes the receipt of the open space other, the water rights, and everything else impossible. As people in this negotiation, the principals look at this and say, it's it's it, that, that's uh, just not possible. It, that's beyond our ability to deal with. I don't know that it would be beyond their ability. I mean, I think we all are very well aware of how the negotiations have been going, how they have gone. Um, so I, I think that the ability is there for anyone. And I think that this is what um, our lane is, which is what is aligned with the charter. And I think how, um, you know, we see these as essential uh, parts of the annexation negotiation. Like I said before, CU is a, a third party that's under the circumstances is we're, we're having to deal with. And, um, you know, it's important for the city to know, the city negotiators to know that these are the concerns that the open space board has before it can make a decision. And if the negotiators cannot get agreement on these conditions or terms, then it's a, it's a further internal conversation with the city entities. So I, I think it's helpful sometimes to simplify, and I'm gonna talk about my experience in private life. Um, if somebody came to me and said, I'd like 119 acres from you, some water rights, and this and this commitment, um, the first question I'd ask is, okay, well, and what am I getting from you? If the answer is nothing, my answer back to them as far as what I'm gonna get them is also nothing. That an the answer is not nothing. The CU is getting annexation. That's the answer. They're, they're trying to get water and sewer to be able to develop their property. I, I understand that piece. Well, I think maybe Phil, our house question could be uh, directed then to uh, council's desire for the flood project and the utilities who's gonna put a lot of um, millions of dollars in time and effort in order to help secure some of these things with, uh, and then if it's delivered with really no sort of sense of what that means for them from, from this board's perspective. I mean, I think everyone's been very vocal about how they feel. There's members of city council that have made it very clear how they feel. Um, CU has handled the negotiations. There's other departments that have done the same thing. Um, you know, this nothing, you know, the public's very well aware. Nothing here really is a, a secret to anyone. Which brings me back to what I, from the beginning, said my preferred outcome here would be, which is, uh, holding the document in draft form as we work through all of these kinks, create it working for the department the way they've really communicated things we missed, frankly, protections we missed, uh, critical things we missed, um, and that signatures on this document won't provide the leverage that those who think signing it in this shape will provide. Um, 
So uh, um, that's that's kind of where I stand. I can't think of some changes to this that that would be helpful, but it's sort of a fundamental thing of I wouldn't take this position in private life. Why would I take it in public life? I mean, I, I appreciate you sharing. I, I feel differently. I think that um, the document as it stands is good. I, I think the opposite of you. I think the document as it stands is good. Yeah, Hal. Yeah, well, I guess I I'm still not understanding your your position because I think CU wants something and the city wants something, and so that that those are the negotiations. And all we're saying is, okay, the something the city wants are these various items. Um, among the things that city wants are these various items that have that pertain to uh, CU. But but just read the language. It specifically asks for the delivery of those items before making a decision. Well, no, it says fulfilled or addressed, and so some of these can't happen before the decision. But there, you know, there needs to be the understanding that you know the time frame and and um, what what the product is uh, will occur. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll just admit right now in front of many people I respect from the public, this is the most challenging position I've ever been in my life. I find myself aligned in purpose and, and goals with my co-board members and yet being faced with doing something that I think is fundamentally not what my private life has educated me works or is productive. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm really quite torn um, because we do have the exact same goals. Which is preservation of open space. Maximum permanent preservation, uh, remediation of the threatened species, every element of it. I think our, our committee made clear through all the additional protect protections that the first draft didn't include what our motivations there were. Um, there were elements where we place confidence in the staff of the open space department to follow their hearts into doing the best possible job. Um, there's many elements of what we did that I just feel pretty strongly about. And, and frankly, I've just, I don't know if others in, on this board have ever negotiated for acquisitions of different things, but I just know what the outcome of the language as it stands is. And but um, representatives of the public to say that, you know, like we're going to put it in the hearts and hope that people do the right thing, that that's not what the taxpayers paid for. You know, that's not why they created the open space board. So, and I see what you're saying. You're saying that we're drawing a really hard line and it's going to come back and hit us in the face. Yeah. And, the, and yeah. And in the previous document, for example, um, rather than just uh, obtaining funding for third party consultation, made it mandatory in many regards, which frankly undermined and discounted the passion that our staff members have, many of whom are national experts in that field. Um, there's basically through my own discussion in committee, I found the merits of arguments different on, on a number of these points. And I mean, convincing. They that, but they're not OSBT and they don't go by the charter. That's what the five OSBT board members do, whether it's us or the next board. That's. Um, the department certainly follows the charter department. Yeah, yeah. No, you're, you're right, Dan. I don't, I don't mean it like that. I, I understand everyone at um, OSMP is is there for OSMP. I just mean for the purpose of this discussion that if we bring in outside entities, we can and we can say that everyone's trying to do this, this or that, but just the way that all documents are created, the way that like we're not a part of annexation because that's not for us, but we have to create something that the community is asking us to do. And I guess, Dan and, and Hal, I think that your reading of this revision or this draft uh, is pretty defensive uh, where staff is concerned. And I, I certainly am sympathetic to that, but that that's not my interpretation of the language of this draft. The language of this draft, I am concerned that the, this project is so monumental that it's going to suck all of the staff time and major funding of the department uh, in order to 
do what we all have said that uh, we think needs to be done. And that is the intent of the third party uh, component is to ensure that the open space department does not uh, you know, end up being solely focused on this particular project because of staffing and funding. Yeah, and, we, I, I, and has the human resources that are needed to get it done. We've heard over and over, we don't have enough staff, we can't do this. And here's something coming down the pike that mm -hmm. is monumental. And I, it, I, 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 I agree and I hear you. And the only reason I'm not just 100% in alignment is that you haven't acknowledged that our committee brought back a document that provided superior project related funding. And that tells me maybe people aren't reading this quite as closely as they think they are. I think that is a gross misinterpretation, Hale. I, I do too. And I didn't keep track of the hours that I've spent reading and analyzing either the committee's work or working on this alternative. And in fact, much of the committee's work is retained in this uh, revision. Correct. Okay. Um, I realize this is water under the bridge, but I, I know when we formed this committee, we really wanted you to be part of this, Karen, um, so that we could have a meeting of the minds. And I know that's something that you you really um, thought, you know, in the moment, seriously about and, and turned us down um, at the last month's meeting. And unfortunately, I, I'm just disappointed that um, an alternate committee was formed. Um, you know, when we, when we were, I, I really felt like we, you had put trust in our hands to bring forward the best po possible product. And then, you know, this morning to get this draft and I understand why you, you did it. And um, I just, uh, I, I, I kind of just wish that, that you would have been part of that. I'm sorry to speak for Karen, but we are here to represent the public. We Absolutely, and and I just this was a collaborative. You, you, guys so appoint, you appointed us to a subcommittee in that meeting. Of course, Caroline, you were actually going to be part of that, and then you sent an email. I don't I don't know if the public is is clear on that. Uh, you were originally going to be part of that, and um and then so Hal stepped up. But during the meeting, we really wanted you to be part of this, and so you know we did our best to form that body of work. And um, and then it sounds like there was a, a you know a lot of other work that went on, and that could have probably possibly been um, like we could have worked together, Karen. I, I feel like and uh, Michelle, and the only work knows. that I've done on this since the May board meeting was after I received the committee's document in the packet. Right, right, it, yeah, I, I I get that. That that's the work that you did not questioning that part. I just wonder whether some of this could have been mitigated. How do you actually, you or Dave, been part of that committee, at, you know, at the time that we appointed the committee members. Now we find ourselves, yes, uh, at 10, 15 at, at night and um, and in disagreements. And like we went through a pretty rigorous process of asking, and trust me, Hal was not on board with a lot of these things. <laughs> in fact, he pushed really hard against this and a lot of these things. And we got a lot of answers about some of these questions of you know, third party experts. And we, we had rigorous debate about them and I, I just um, kind of bummed that we are, you know, at this point. To be, to, be specific, to be specific, I pressed hard on every issue I could think of, with the exception of the uh, mechanism, which I knew when it's an attempt to deliver num nothing for everything, was just, frankly, getting towards nonsensical. Um, and uh, and that's, that's just who I am as a human being. Um, but... Suffice it to say, uh, I don't. I I really don't even know what to do really next as far as action because we have three trustees that are in pretty clear agreement on this. I don't think they fully understand the ramifications of how this may impact the annexation negotiation. But why? Why do you think that that our minds are not competent or capable enough to understand what you're understanding? Like Just why do you think that we're not? 
just because I took the time to be in the committee. It's just my opinion. It's not about uh, it's but what not you a did in the last four weeks doesn't encompass what's been going on in Boulder for 20 years. Like, I, I have incredible right? respect for all my co-board members. I think I've made that clear the whole way. All I'm trying to do is tell you that I think there's there's th basically there's certain requests that I'd like if, if there is going to be any action related to this, an element of good faith representation that we did all this work not for not, but really to deliver something non-functional, like the words good faith, something to that in the in the uh, document is really helpful. I really think the elements of joint and several on the conditions were more specific, more helpful, more directive. Um, there's just elements of it that, um, yeah, I don't know. This is just that that's where I stand. So with that said, we really do owe it to the staff here who's thinking about mud snails to decide uh, which way to go on this. Um, I first off really want to honor, I, I do not mind the intellectual scrum and I certainly respect where the votes fall. Um, I, I do think that this is hasty. Um, I don't think it's fully considered. My opinion is an unsigned document that has the potential to actually do something helpful for the department is better than a signed document that will likely end up causing problems that people don't anticipate. I, and, I, and I'm humble enough to know I don't know the problems that it will create. I mean, it's a game of what us, you know, you can only do what you do. And the, the second document is in line with the open space charter and is also in line with what the public said tonight. I mean, it's as simple as that. We have the charter and, and we're here to be public servants. I The other thing I want to make sure that you've heard expressed, Hal, is I've heard my colleagues praise the work of the committee. And, and I believe I have also, and I think you came up with some provisions that were not in the draft that we looked at at May that are very important. And I think you did an incredible amount of work. And I don't want to minimize that. And I want to make sure that you feel I do not seek accolades. Basically, I'd just like to return to what Caroline said. And I think the viewpoint you hold has a ton of merit, frankly. The reading of the charter, what we heard from the public, if that's the case, people should just say they don't want to dispose it rather than making a document that just riddles the process with what will amount to a tangle. But personally, I think that that's too soon, which is why that, like, that's not where so, I'm at. And I don't think other people are there either. So, so there's the other option, which is we, we've sent a pretty clear message about what these conditions are liable to be. We're largely unanimous on what those conditions are with the exception of technicals. And so it really boils down to how much do people desire wet ink on the paper or not this evening? I would like to vote. Yeah, I think it's I think it's necessary for us to to take a formal action. Hell, um, I'm okay with, the, and I'm trying to find a place to put you know our efforts in a good you know good faith effort, if if that's helpful, uh, because I think that underlies all of our efforts, and uh, I I don't think we're asking the world for nothing. In fact, I. I think that uh, these conditions and terms are part of any decision process for this proposed project. Karen, yeah. are you in agreement on that? I agree with what Dave just said, yes. All right, Dan, I think we probably do need to put off um, the mud snail discussion, unfortunately. I'm, I'm very sorry um, to the staff members who are prepared to do that, but in the in the realm of not taking this till midnight and making sure people's minds are sharp while we're doing very important work, I think that we need to go that direction. I think that's a good decision, Hal. Is that okay with you, Dan? Um, 
I think John and uh, John's probably most impacted by, by this, but um, I don't know, John, do you, any timing concerns on your end? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, staff are saying they're willing to hang out, Hal. If, if really, yeah, that's incredibly gracious. Um, I I don't know how long I, this discussion of this paragraph will take. Um, I think we could probably try and do it quickly. I'm. Um, uh, and so, now there's also the option is we could deliver the presentation. We're not looking for any action on the mud snails. It's it's sort of you know it's in the management realm, and we certainly could skinny it down, get through uh, the presentation, some clarifying questions, and then if there's additional questions that you all want answered, certainly you could provide email. We could do a supplemental memo next month. Okay. Uh, uh, based be primarily because it's not an action item. All right, this is incredibly may I, great. Oh, go ahead. May I add a comment? The council does not take up new issues after 11 o'clock unless there's unanimous agreement on council that that uh, track should be followed. And, and I think that wrapping this up is gonna take us till 11 o'clock-ish. And, and so I just think it would be better for it, since there's no action on the, the mud snail issue to, expected tonight for staff to proceed with their work. I would much rather wrap up this discussion and have that addressed fully on our July 14th agenda. Unfortunately, there are still a lot of members of the public listening as well. Not unfortunately, but to be considered. Good point. Yep. Yeah, I do know they they came for this topic. Uh, although many, I'm sure, are interested in mud snails. Hal, you could do a straw poll of your trustees to see how many want to hang on or 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 make a call right now. I think we just got to. I feel like the straw poll has been taken. All right. All right. Um, so can, who has the ability to edit the, the document itself? I, I don't mind, but Karen or Dave or whichever one we're working off of, I don't, I could probably switch it to one. I only have the PDF. Um, so if you tell me which section we're working on first, I can try and move that over. Or if you have something that you can send my way. Um, I think I could send a word doc your way. Would that work? That, yeah. While you're doing that, can I just bring up a, a work plan issue? If, if we, and I know that, uh, I think you mentioned, Dan, that we've had at least 12 meetings about this project in the recent past. If we go down this path of approving a resolution with the idea that there will be additional conversations about this rather than a conditional disposal where we are trying to strike a binding agreement, that we agree that we let it be, or, you know, and, until there's a 30% whatever plan, um, project plan, um, or we really agree that there's some things in our work plan that we're not gonna get to, so staff can adjust accordingly. And so we're not kind of thrown in this and we can just kind of plan ahead that if we're gonna take this up every single month, until November, then we're wiping the slate clean and we're saying we're not getting any other OSBT business done. Well, I, I, I tend to agree. We, we have to be careful of that. I think right now there's a press to do this at this moment for some particular reason. Um, I'm not 100% aware of, but um, it, 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 and after this, there's gonna be a moment of not discussing it for a while. We have a study session planned this summer. Yep. So. 
Do you uh, say November? Because what's what's in November? So when uh, staff some... laid when staff laid out our series of conversations, what we proposed was uh, three topics that we we get into, which is the potential to restore the OSO and what that may look like and and mean. Uh, to provide you with information that the uh, utilities department has gleaned about the groundwater situation. And then um, at the point when the utilities are, are at about the 30% design of the flood project to come back to us and uh, uh, with some specifics of, of what the design is looking like and how that sort of mixes and matches with uh, past uh, recommendations of the board. And Dan, is that still expected for the fall sometime? The 30%? Uh, last was it could be, it could still happen in the fourth quarter, but I haven't gotten an update in the last week or two, but. Okay. I and, and therein really, I think is the core of the last piece of argument that I'll make on this, which is that by keeping the draft open until such time as that information is on the table, would be advantageous. And um, I personally just feel that the document as it stands influences this negotiation seriously and that we will lose leverage uh, as a result of this. And that will be my final piece other than talking about the language. Well, what is the update on annexation? Is, is that put off till November? No. 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 I'll, I'll, I'll put this out there. This is, this is not a disposal situation, so it's, it's non-binding. I mean, it's, um, uh, this board could change this next week if it wanted to, um, based on what it says. You could just leave the word draft in the heading and still pass the a motion. Janet, you can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> still pass the motion adopting this as a draft. Um, and so you still have a vote and you're still leaving it to fill in some details as we go on. And, and then um, to add to that, Janet, and then even if it was a draft, um, would the document then be able to be used um, during annexation so they could understand um, what OSBT's position? If, Janet, before you answer, so, our, our relationship with this project and the, and the disposal requests is, is with the flood mitigation project in the utilities department. Um, so to, to say this is directly now to the planning department or, just, or to city council about the annexation, then I, I think Janet's gonna raise the concern again, um, but. No, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, you're right. That's, thank you, Dan, that's exactly my concern. It seems that the board is trying to direct or can be interpreted as trying to direct what happens in the annexation. And that is not within the purview of the board. Um, one, uh, may I ask Janet, um, is it possible to uh, make a motion to recommend council read closely the a draft conditional resolution? <laughs> <laughs> that, and then it really does represent pretty much unanimous business. Um, we're, the only thing we're not unanimous on, practically speaking, is the mechanism. I don't know any procedural reason why you couldn't. I guess what you have to consider is, um, you know, will that be persuasive? Yeah. It's all a question of what's persuasive. Um, Regardless, why don't we work on the language and see if we can't find something we're happy with, huh? Leah, do you have the Word document now? Okay. So Janet, while we're doing that, I, I guess uh, I would ask you, and, and again, I'm reiterating what I said before, is that these requirements for our decision uh, are, gonna be, are gonna be in play no matter what. And so they're tied to the annexation agreement just because the city has determined that that uh, decision on annexation can include or should include or will include uh, the, the elements that are part of the disposal. 
there's no need on the open space board's part to have that as part of the annexation agreement if uh, the city comes up with other alternatives to meet the environmental mitigation requirements that we've outlined for disposal. And so I don't see it as directing the annexation negotiation as, look, you know, this is what we're gonna need. For the this is what the board needs for a decision. And, you know, if you don't wanna have it in the annexation agreement, then we're gonna have to figure out some other mechanism or element to do it. So I don't see it as being directive. It's so difficult because it's so coupled. You know, I've, I've heard city council um, beg representatives of CU to separate the two, like let them be different things and it's, it doesn't seem to happen. So I think we're all trying to like keep them separate things, but there is the reality of, of what it is. I, I agree. I, 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 the only nuance I see different here is, is that I think by focusing the document on the needs of the open space and mountain parks department fundamentally in its interests, that that is where we gain our best leverage. And I, I just don't believe ink on the signature really moves the needle as much as people perceive. But um, if there's going to be ink, I think we can find some non-committal language that everybody can get more comfortable with. But how the, for example, the 119 acre, the 119 acres are, you know, what are in play. That's basically what we've said are, what we've determined are going to be in play for consideration for the impact mitigation. If, if we say, well, you know, we don't care about the 119 acres, then we're going to do something else, then we're out of there. That's what I, I guess I, I don't understand the... Uh, I, I don't understand that comment, Dave. I don't think anybody's talking about changing that part. Um, but if that, if that ha hypothetically, if that happened. Yeah, but then we're inextricably bound if, in the annexation conversation. That's what I'm saying. And, you know, and if people perceive that to be directive, then we haven't been, uh, have been able to determine any other alternative. It's just like the flood, the flood project design, the flood wall. Yep. That's the best alternative for construction. So we're saying, okay, well, you know, CU annexation is the best vehicle for determining mitigation. Yep, I, 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 I hear you. Let's uh, get to work and do our best work for the citizens of Boulder and the Open Space Mountain Parks Department. Well, I have one uh, minor suggestion, which you brought up, Hal, and that is in that whereas, that's right there, the whereas, the bottom line is satisfy such conditions before any formal disposal request will be considered in good faith by the Open Space Board of Trustees. Thank you. Um, Uh, do we need uh, three words officially, finally, and formally? How about just officially? Yeah, that would be fine. Hal, if I might add something, I'm. This is Janet Michaels. I'm concerned because um, the charter requires if a request for a disposal is made that staff makes a recommendation and OSBT considers it. So you can't say that you won't consider something unless. Um, well, um, read more closely. I don't think it says not con will not be considered. Does it? Yeah, it says it will be considered in good faith. Before any, it, before any formal it, it disposal doesn't say request will be considered. We won't. It just says it, this has, has to happen before we will. 
I feel like the, the whole in, in good faith and, and trying to communicate with everyone involved is to let them know, let counsel know what our position is so that they're able to better do their job. You know, that this document is, is for counsel. Um, so, uh, basically, um, it, it, may I ask, is the therefore paragraph even necessary given what's said in the first paragraph and does that address any of your concerns, Janet? I'm, I'm trying to find that specific language, um, and it might be in I'm trying to find the specific language that I was referencing. I know that we've discussed it. And maybe the open space folks who do a lot of disposals can help direct me. Is it in the other document? Uh, no, no, it could be in our... Well, we have, um, Janet, we have an open, we have a open space board of trust policy on... Okay. Uh, how to consider what is called a, a easement request, uh, which is how, what we use as the guiding document for uh, process for disposals, um, in which it does dictate or does state that um, w once we do get uh, the information that uh, uh, is necessary that we shall act upon that. And I think it says at the next meeting or something like that. But uh, that's just the policy. Um, I'm getting a, uh, a text from Bethany that it might be 171 C. One seventy one C. Yeah, I don't. I have too, so many things that's up on where, the screen. Yeah, that's where staff ha it makes the request. And now, thank you, Bethany. I think that that it might be in one seventy five. Um, shall make recommendations to the board concerning any proposed disposal of open space lands. Um, so if there's a proposed disposal, the board has to make a recommendation. So, and that's section 175A. My, my point is if you say we won't consider it unless these conditions are met. What 175A says to me is that if there is a proposed disposal, the board shall make a recommendation. So in effect, what you're saying is we, we will not agree to dispose of the land unless these conditions are met. But I feel like we're trying to help them be in line with the charter so that it is a possibility. Because as of now, if you go by the charter on what you are allowed to dispose of, it we wouldn't be able to. So the communication is there to say our hands are tied because it's, it's not really a decision um, that we make outside of the charter. The charter clearly states their purposes. So if we don't communicate with other people, this is what we need to, to be able to do this then if we go by the charter, we, we couldn't. Well, the charter anticipates situations where open space would be requested to uh, dispose of interest of lands for non-open space purposes. I think that's why the whole disposal process is out in anticipation of working in a urban wildland interface that we, that the department would be getting requests for non-open space purpose use. Can I look, I have our charter in front of me. Does someone um, know what section everyone's talking about here? Yes, it's 170, what did you say, Jens? Um, 75A. 75A. 175A.
And then again, I mean, I think there's the, the reason there's 177 is that at, uh, the drafters anticipated situations where we would be getting requests to dispose of interests of land for a reason, one reason or another. And then it, it outlines how that decision, how that decision would be made. Correct. I agree with that. And Janet, I don't think that the language in the whereas says that we won't consider. It basically says that this is what we need to consider. And, and so if, there, if we don't get that, then, there, the, then we don't vote for disposal. And that's the outcome. And so I, I guess I'm perplexed that we're having a problem with that. Yeah, I don't think 175A conflicts with the language either, as I read it. One seventy one also requires the department to make a recommendation to the board. Um, but if this is it's it's going to come down to an interpretation. I guess what I'm trying to say is that it kind of did tonight. somebody could somebody could challenge um, based on the language and say that the re the resolution is ultra vires because you can't say that you won't do something that the charter requires. I'm just trying to protect the process so that once we do come up with language, once the board comes up with language they want for the resolution that somebody couldn't challenge it. Um, the the if, paperwork in the packet tonight asked for a conditional disposal. You asked. It's asked. What the language says is before we'll consider a disposal request, these are the conditions that have to be satisfied before any formal disposal request will be considered. In the one in the in the packet tonight. The so new language. Uh, the new language says that. We would say that about any disposal request. I mean, we would not make a disposal decision based on no information. Well, how is it worded in the-, in the I, I agree with that, Dave. The problem is this asks for deliverables in advance of a, a consideration that are extremely hard to obtain. So how what's in the, the, the packet version where it is worded and that there are all of these conditions that made it um, okay? Well, well, I remind you, uh, the, the committee wasn't seeking dried ink on paper with quite the same um, interest. We were, we were engaged in good committee work we thought was improving a document. But still with conditions for a disclosure. Yes. Yep. Oh, no, the, it's just that the level, of, uh, the level of intensity rises when we're about to enact. It's very yeah. different when we're discussing a draft. Well, and we, I mean, you know, we all want to do this the right way and we, we want it to be, um, you know, good for council. So I'm just, you know, how do we do that? Because I, I feel like what we've said is that the document is the same, that there's just a couple of specifics where we're not aligned. So if that is true, then where are those specifics and how do we get them aligned so that what you created um, with staff and attorney is the same as this? Well, I think you're looking at it. We're working on it right now. Um, this, this, this is the crux. This is the mechanism. This is, and so, uh, fr frankly, frankly, I feel like the way it's written, it's lower stakes than the one that we had. Um, but as a result of it being lower stakes is also what reduces its actual practical help to the city help in the process, because it really defines a lot more about um, basically sets up a near impossibility. But um, that being said, I, I think underlying it is, is sort of a tone of people really want to clearly communicate that after all these years of conditions that we put in, we're actually not that close um, yet, and that's fine. That's that's fine. 
So Janet, would the document um, that was in the packet tonight only work if it was attached to a conditional disposal? Otherwise, it would never really be able to do anything. Uh, it, do anything as in what we are trying to do with the with the this document on the screen. I'm sorry, Carolyn, I can't answer that question. Because that's what it, it would appear, right? Like it would have to be attached to the disposal. To dis it would have to be all together. I think the difference, I'll try to say this in a different way than how uh, attempted to say that earlier, is that we weren't attempting to create a disposal document tonight. We were attempting to create a draft, another draft of the document that we had last time. So we weren't trying to pass a disposal where we are trying to call for, I think, a vote of this document, which is outlining disposal language. Yes. Is that the difference? How am I, am I trying to convey? It? But the draft was made to be a conditional disposal. Like it, it's in a it's in an early phase. It is a draft, but the end result would be a conditional disposal, as opposed to. That's the way that I read it. Yeah, Michelle. Yeah. the The ultimate outcome of the of the committee subcommittee's draft is a conditional disposal, and in addition to that, then a newspaper uh, notification goes in on a disposal action that none of the rest of the board even knew about. And so when you say we, you know, it wasn't meant to be a disposal, there were at least two formal actions that were taken with disposal as the central feature. Let, let, let's, let's be clear that it was the original documents language that caused um, the requirement to be met. That's not clear. The, uh, it was the first understand. draft of all that that led to the notice requirement. I, I don't think that technicality is getting us anywhere, but um, well, suffice it to say, I'm very pleased we have the public with us because this is important work. No, I, I, I mean, Michelle said it right. Um, you, there's There's three board members who would like to put ink on paper this evening. And um, there's two board members who think that we have a lot of leverage in this discussion by staying on a really good faith track of working a document, demonstrating that we're actually compiling our uh, previous motions, that we're doing due diligence on the nature of the IDMOU, that we're addressing all of the things and, and showing uh, city council that we are alongside in this process and in and reviewing the stuff that really matters to them in this discussion. Um, but I, you know, and this so that they can have facts during annexation agreements. We're, we're doing all of these things right now so that they are better prepared for that. So they don't have all of these discussions and then turn around and have things come at them that they're not aware of. Exactly. And if I were to really just, I think that there's workable language that we can do to move forward. But if I were to just say my piece as simple as possible, you would prefer to have a signed document this evening. And I believe an unsigned draft in many ways serves the board and the department's interests better. And that's the fundamental disagreement. I would agree with that. Because I think both documents uh, in what you characterized as the process, Hal, even though it was pejorative toward this one, both documents are intending to um, have that be the process. The distinction is whether it, there's a formal action that is taken. Yes. And, um, and, and to really work the document right and get it right, along with a couple well-placed telephone calls to important people to say, I don't know if you saw the meeting, but it's getting pretty unanimous on these conditions and it's important you understand. Uh, that's another legitimate way to go. Um, and frankly, I just feel on this one I, and I'm, I'm willing to work with you on this language. And I think you already just quickly made some progress. Putting well, us on what, record. What other progress faith. would we need to make to be able to move forward? Un unanimously. 
I don't know. Okay. Um, I think I, I think I, I think that some additional basically I like the language about the individual and several element from the old piece. I think we can bring that back in. And then I, I just think that the two paragraphs essentially say the same thing twice, which isn't helpful. And you can basically just leave it as we won't formally consider a disposal until these conditions are met. And we and our expectation is that they're met both individually and severally. And then, um, yeah, at this point, it's too late to, to worry about the IDMOU. Uh, we're on the hook to renegotiate that in the future and some of the other good things that we worked on. But, uh, you know, if, if it's what we need to do to move forward, I'm fine with that. But before we do this with our time, even if you're saying that there are two paragraphs that are redundant, what you just said is what Janet said cannot be said. So I think we just need to get really clear on what we're able to do, regardless of if, if we all agree or not. Okay. Um, so, I, yeah. Hal, are the two paragraphs you're referring to the whereas and the therefore? Yes. Mm -hmm. So if we remove the therefore and add individually and severally to the whereas? You're making good progress with me, yep. We can do that. I, I want this document to be perceived by the counterparties that are involved as something serious, professional, and in good faith. That's my that's my only requirement here. And everyone agrees with that. Yeah, I, it, I fully agree that I think what we're going for and what what we've all been working for is something that's professional and serious and in good faith. So if we take out the therefore, and I don't know, you'll have to, we'll have to see where we insert uh, individually and severally. How about right after the first phrase, first line? The OSBT is hereby mm -hmm. specifying the terms and conditions that will need to be satisfied both individually and severally. Great, yep. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it right back up. Something's happening with my, <laughs> Formatting that's like okay. deleting. So Leah, can, you, can you do that? <laughs> that has, Leah, that has to do with the document itself. Okay. Uh, there was a table, an old table embedded in it when I got it from, uh, who'd I get it from? Hal? Uh, from the subcommittee. Okay. And so we deleted the table that helped a lot but there there are some formatting quirks in it that have just been a nightmare to deal with yeah okay give i think i can let me it was it was viewing fine and then um i don't know what happened but let me try one more thing <laughs> my heart is with you <laughs> Since we're at a stopping point and it is almost 11, do we need to, um, Hal, do we need to, to say something about continuing or we don't, or we don't have to? Um, at this point on the procedural, I'm in the cover our, our basis piece with something of this intensity. So let's get a raise of hands for people willing to continue at this time. All right, thank you. It's unanimous that we will continue. Ta -da! Well, okay, yeah, I hope it sticks. So sorry, Dave, I might have you repeat what you just said. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> I what no, what we were talking we're about is is in this no in the second line up there after the word satisfied, comma both individually and severally. Right? Yeah. Yes. And I don't know, Hal, I, if um, you think we ought to include the rest of that sentence. Double, double L, I think. Um, so it's, and the in, inability to achieve any of these conditions or the non-performance on any of these conditions. We'll, uh, it, uh, 
Um, yeah. I, I, I guess I guess it's not as that is no longer as relevant because um, we're saying don't even bring the request until this is the perform. We're we're not close to performance anyway. I I think this is enough. Thank you. Okay. Um, Leah, there should be a common a comma after severally, and then and then right before the end of the sentence by the OSBT. Correct, right? Before the word by. In good faith. Yep. You got it. And Leah severally has two L's now. Uh, we're going to take out a finally and formally. Uh, yes. Um, and why don't do we need approve or can we say consider because that's what we're saying? Okay, I think that's good. For consistency, right. Um, and furthermore, to infraction associated with the Sorry to interrupt. Should we say consider a recommendation or is, is consider fine? Uh, for disposal, the board would need to approve and recommend. That, that wording sounds if, better. If you were going to say recommend, it's actually an approval and a recommendation. So, so better to leave consider or? Or would consider approving and recommending the disposal if you wanted to really draw it out, but I don't think it's necessary. If, if you think consider uh, approve, approve and recommend, if we're using the word officially, it should be approve and recommend, I think, right? Officially approve and recommend. Would not officially consider the approval and recommendation of a disposal. I think that's good. Uh, um, and does when we say uh, okay so yeah what else do you think Hal OSMP and Power Shop were clearly saw committed installation operation agreements and delivery of our system. I guess uh, I don't I, I don't have much more to say there. I really think that um, the 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 group should consider leaving the flood wall section in there. Um, leaving or not leaving? Leaving. So accepting the, the flood wall section as is strikes me as additional protection and, and it should be left as is. Are you talking about number five or are you talking yep, about number five? Yep. Number five. Uh, we're okay with that, aren't we, Karen? Well, my concern is that it's talking about goals and goals are just pretty general and non actionable. They're good goals though. <laughs> yeah. Well, Cal feels okay, but let's make them, let's make them. Uh, I, I understand Karen, but we are giving you the opportunity to flesh that out through the draft of an actual executable conditional agreement. And, and that's been rejected. So um, they, they wouldn't have been goals, they would have been requirements, but. Wait, say that again? It says goals right there in your document. Yep. And, and, uh, uh, whatever, I, I just, this, this mystifies me what the fight is here. Um, it's an example of what I thought was really high quality work by the committee to add protection to this document. And if it's your will to, in my opinion, essentially loosen it up for a reason I don't see, um, I'm just, I just don't get it. 
I think I think we have already talked about putting back in to each one of the five point one two three documents the words minimal. Yep. To and protect. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, Leah, on five point one, before the word footprint, the words a minimal footprint. for the flood wall, for 5.2, the most limited construction impact footprint, that's right. You have two impacts, is that? Yeah, get rid of impact, the most limited, and then construction impact or oh yeah <laughs> yeah get rid of the first impact and keep the second impact good and then 7.3 a termination on the east end of the flood wall, that is as far away. Just, just undelete that phrase. Good. And the next one, the determination of a minimum of and delete the. And on 5.5, .5, a groundwater system. like that one. That's all I have from our previous discussion. Okay. Um, Dave and Karen, I, uh, did you get a chance to read Tom Isaacson's email? Yes. I did. Is there, you did, that was not addressed in this document, correct? That's correct. Do and you for, feel me, for me, yeah. the reason is it's, it's premature. It's, not relevant to the intent or the purpose of this document. It's too far down the road and it's too specific. Leah, could you go down to the other environmental impacts section, which keep going, keep going. It, it should be in red. There, there, it is. Is. there it is. So this is where I think if we do reference that, this is where it probably should go. And I'm thinking that we just put a, a IV, <laughs> per, IV print or four in, in say, you know, any flood storage. Let me see, I better get it right. Uh, requirement from future flooding or something. Sorry, can you can you say that again? Uh, you're doing well. Any flood storage requirement from future flooding? I, I appreciate that. There's some very astute thinking going on on that topic, and it's important we're all aware of it. Do you think that that covers the issue? 
Uh, I think for this time, given the current mechanism. Okay. Um, I'd like to uh, open this up to John and Dan. Do you have comments that you would like to raise at this point? Uh, fortunately, a lot of the stuff that is here really is the committee's work. I think you've got pretty good transparency on what's changed. I'd love to hear both your thoughts. Hmm. Um, well, John was, um, you know, the OSMP rep that was invited in to have the discussion. So I certainly uh, invite him to chime in. Um, overall, since this is, you know, we're not viewing this document as a conditional disposal it's, it doesn't have that binding effect of then going to council where council needs to act on it and if something sort of a quote unquote official happens. Um, even though it's in resolution form, my overall opinion on it is that it's, 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 it's a strongly worded statement, uh, but certainly if the board uh, feels like it wants to at any future time to open back this back up and edit it, refine it, um, you know, it, it's left in that format that uh, the board has that ability. Um, so, um, I guess I guess what I'm trying to say, if we catch something that is really problematic, we certainly could revisit it. Well, it is interesting how circular that is. We come back to uh, being quite similar, an unsigned draft being quite similar to a non-disposal, which is signed. <laughs> right. Um, okay, D John, are you there still? Okay, um, Karen, Dave, any final elements here? Um, admissions of things you don't know you don't know on this, other, anything that worries you? Yeah, a lot of things worry me, and I don't know what I don't know. So we're basically there. <laughs> and I'm worried that I don't know. So am I. So I'm glad we're both a little worried. <laughs> Caroline? I think um, we, we came together and, and did, did a good job on uh, mitigating the mitigation. Okay. I'm sure it's I'm sure it's very obvious in the draft that that we've all been reading and working with. Um, but I just want to point out that because we moved up decommissioning and city ownership to number 12, uh, we have deleted the other two provisions about an interdepartmental memor interdepartmental memor memorandum of understanding. Uh, because we didn't feel they were important for this particular document. And uh, I don't know if you have any big concerns with that or not, but I still feel that's appropriate. No, I, I think the committee made its case that it becomes very important at some stage. Um, yep. And in the direction we were working on, which was a really more action-oriented document, was necessary. And I take your argument that it is not necessary in a non-action oriented document. Okay, great. Um, okay. So I think, uh, I think we know a couple of people who probably aren't likely to make this motion. <laughs> Um, Hal, if, if um, uh, John got kicked off and um, he did raise a question that he just wants to uh, make sure we're all comfortable with. So I don't know, John, if you're technologically able to um, chime in at this point, but I. 
Well, maybe he's still having technical difficulties. But. Yeah, I saw him. He kept getting out and coming back in. Yeah. Um, let me just try to see if I can get a hold of him in another man. Do you have the question, Dan? Oh, Leah, can you unmute John if you can see him? He might not have re-entered as a host. There he is. Or, or Allison. Says he's a hey, sorry, everyone. I um, I had to. Uh, I I got bumped out and then came back in. You um, you went to bed. <laughs> hopefully soon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I just I just wanted to. Um, uh, I just wanted to understand from a staff perspective, uh, sort of the expectation around um, the the part of the motion that talks about reporting periodically on the uh, on the resolution of these of these conditions. Um, since it's not in the form of a conditional disposal, is that sort of what you're in essence referring to, John? Or yeah, that yeah. We did because it yeah. We sorry. didn't want to. We didn't want to designate monthly or quarterly or anything. Uh, and we figure when enough progress has been made, you'll report. In good faith. In good faith, periodically. <laughs> well, well, actually, Karen, I okay. don't understand if they have to meet all of the conditions why they need to report periodically. They, they're only gonna come with a request once they're all fulfilled, no? That's what, you, that's what we've asked for. Maybe they would want to check in. Wouldn't that be the in good faith? Just let them do what they think is best. I think, yeah, whatever. You see my point, but we'll, if progress is made or not, I'm sure we'll find out. Well, I think um, what, okay. what we're trying to do, Hal, is to make sure that the conversation uh, continues between you know the board and staff. Um, and periodically was meant that, you know, it, it's, it is more meaningful than just, you know, something at the end where you come in and say all the conditions are met. I think that, um, you know, working together through the whole process is extremely important. And, and you know, I just want to say we've been, some of us have been at, at this for three or four years already. Mm -hmm. And it's a, as somebody said earlier, it is a massive, huge project and it will keep coming back and there will keep being issues. And there's no doubt in my mind about that. Um, I, I know that uh, the, doc, the draft document is done, but the title I think still referred to it as attachment C. And I think oh. somewhere in the document attachment C is still referenced in some locations and we might just yeah. clean that up. It could be confusing. Well, um, I I think the top two lines can just be deleted. Right, right. That was just for reference. And I, if there's any other attachment C references in the document, I don't know if there is or not. But good point. The, uh, there are not, and we okay. ought to take the word draft out of the uh, next line, right? Yep. And as well as the date line, yep. Yeah. And while we're considering that, just Hal, just for the record, uh, there are a lot more actions that uh, are involved in this resolution than just the conditional disposal. So I guess I would appreciate uh, you're not continuing to refer to that as being the only action. Well, yeah, it will, but that's the thing. But I mean, this comes back to my core point, Dave, which is it's going to be tough for people to take a lot of these actions and lift heaven and earth to make these things possible without a counterparty who, who, who's in the negotiation and present. But that's the core difference of opinion that we've had and which, uh, you know, has been won. So, 
Well, there's a certain element of trust as well uh, on both sides. And I think that's gonna be extremely important. Can we take one final scroll down as we go? Just want to just get eyes on the last remaining red parts. Yep, yep, yep. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, there's a we are an extra carriage return I'm, uh, uh, on line five slash seven. Uh, and there are a lot of those throughout the document. Yeah, well, uh, there, there'll be some cleanup on formatting. Thank you. Okay. okay. All right, um, so I, I'm, I'm good. Anyone else with any final words? I'll chime in. I mean, I haven't fallen asleep over here, um, <laughs> even though I've been quiet. I haven't been offering a lot of input, um, really, because I, I, in good faith, wanted, I just wasn't going to offer um, nitpicks or, or edits, um, knowing that I'm not going to vote for this resolution. Um, I do feel like I acted in good faith within our committee um, to put an actionable item um, and a resolution together. Um, but I don't feel that this is a, an action-oriented document. And I, and, and, and uh, Dave, you, you mentioned there's an element of trust. I've heard that a few times this evening. But I feel like there's some fundamental things here that are built on distrust. Um, and I was willing to make compromises on those if we were going to make compromises on these things um, in terms of getting us past a line where we could have a binding agreement. And, uh, but clearly we're not getting there. And um, I understand that I'm, I'm in the minority here. But it, that's that's why I haven't been um, actively engaged here in the last I don't know <laughs> four hour and a half. Um, but um, but I know that we've covered a lot of ground, and I respect that you all feel this way, and I um, I hope that you respect that I feel this way too. Certainly, I I think. Um, you know, I definitely respect your opinion. I, I think other board members do as well. And I think that that is the makeup of a board. You know, it, it's not always going to be unanimous. There's different views and different representations. And that's, that's okay. Like, that's what we're here for. Great. So um, given that I was on the whole unsigned draft thing, uh, who is it that would like to do the honors here? Um, Hal, if I could just suggest that in the motion that you provide some staff the authority to do some, um, um, as we would call it, clean up, make sure the numbering's right. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll need to manipulate this document and I just want to be clear that we would do that and even express it in the motion somehow. That's great. I mean, I, 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 um, I really appreciate people I, I, I don't want to exactly write or raise this motion myself. So I move that OSBT approve um, this resolution to city council. And uh, authorize staff to uh, put put the final uh, clean and format. Okay, 
to clean the for to clean up the format. Make additional edit corrections as needed. Clean and format as needed. How about clean format and correct grammatical or spelling errors? as needed pri prior to forwarding it to council. If I could just chime in at this time, I, <laughs> I know everybody's anxious probably to get out of here, but uh, Leah, um, are we, I know that sometimes when we have a, a motion on the table, it does it become official once it becomes part of the next round of minutes? Or I'm a little unclear on that, oh, like be able yeah. to clean format and deliver this without having to be reapproved through the motion of the next meeting? Jana is still here, she can correct me, but my understanding is they are it's technically still draft until the minutes are approved at the next meeting, but kind of as like a process, we wouldn't let we sh we shouldn't plan to change the motion again, even though it's still technically draft. Um, probably right, but, but we could forward this motion to council. I mean, I, I think it's the board's desire that this gets to council as as soon as it can. And, and that would be before the next board meeting um, in which the minutes are approved. Yeah, and I, I, I think we've make done that, that clear. before. I think we've done that before just with that caveat language of, of this will be, you know, approved as part of the minutes at the next meeting. But like, we've done that before. Yeah, okay. I think you're exactly right, Leah. Oh, good. I'm glad you're still here, Janet. <laughs> <laughs> I could have said anything. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I second the motion. Okay, with that, we can call the roll. Caroline Miller. Yes. Michelle Estrella. No. And I will vote affirmatively in support. So the motion passes four to one. Um, and uh, again, um, uh, I'm, I'm very sorry that we had to push the uh, management response to mud snails. Um, but I think that this was an important piece of work that sort of uh, was having to happen. So, and so thank you all for staff members who are still with us, who stuck with us, members of the public who stuck with us. Um, we do uh, normally have matters from the board before closing, but I imagine at this point there's probably a few matters, correct? Great. So with that, I will thank everybody. Karen? I have two questions about dates. Um, we were told that uh, the plague management plan was June 21st, but I don't have a time for that meeting. Does anybody have a time for that meeting? Like where we're supposed to save on our calendar to make that happen? Is that the public meeting? Yeah. Uh, John, do you have that at your fingertips or? Uh, yeah, give me one second here. We, we can handle offline perhaps. I, I can okay. send a, send it out on an email or something if you want. Okay, okay. let's do that. And, and the, there was another date um, that we were supposed to hold. Yeah. Was it in June as well? I thought so. Do you know well, what it could be? Dan? I can't remember. I can't remember what yeah. it was. Yeah, email us tomorrow morning when it comes to okay. you and we'll, and we'll follow up with you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Hearing nothing else, um, we can adjourn this Open Space Board of Trustees meeting at 1128. Thank you all for your time uh, and especially committee members for the time. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks.